What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonners. This is episode 93, so we're rapidly approaching our celebratory 100th episode. But today, I've got a very special guest joining us on the Wrestling with Jonners podcast. I'll introduce that special guest very, very soon. But we are going to be concentrating on a few topics today. Uh, we are going to be looking uh, just one day removed from NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool 2. So that takes place tomorrow on the WWE Network or live in person if you're lucky like me. So we're going to be covering all of the matches that are set to go down in Blackpool tomorrow with my special guest. We're also going to be looking and covering this week's AEW Dynamite and NXT, two excellent uh, shows. Uh, and, and as always, they didn't disappoint. And uh, we're also going to be looking at some of the hot talking points from the wrestling world from the last seven days. Um, so I, at this point, I usually go into all my social media links and kind of cover off all my Twitters, Instagrams. Don't need to now. I'm just going to give you one link to go to, and that's our brand you wrestling with Jonas website wrestlingwithjonas.com go there to find all of our social media links uh, our merch links um, our archive of podcasts video casts interviews and uh, yeah news articles and we've got a, a team of writers that are putting up uh, articles um, every single week so lots to cover there wrestlingwithjonas.com go and check it all out there and like I say all of our social media links are at the top of the page and our full archive of podcasts as well um, but that leads me to our special guest that's going to be helping us cover uh, TakeOver Blackpool 2, AEW and NXT. And that's uh, Foul from Foul Original Podcast and YouTube channel. So good afternoon, sir. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for having me on. I've, uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, we get to talk about so much today. It's a great Saturday afternoon. Got myself a coffee and uh, I'm ready to talk about some wrestling. Awesome, awesome, and so am I. It's quite a big uh, weekend for wrestling fans, especially if you're a fan of um, the NXT product and NXT UK in particular. We're going to be covering the Takeover Blackpool card a bit later on. But uh, are you are you a fan of NXT UK? Have you been following it since it's been on our TV screens on the network for the last year, year and a, a few months, Val? Yeah, so I've, I've been really excited from it. Um, obviously, Pete Dunne is from Birmingham. I'm from Birmingham. So it's a pretty big deal for me to see him hold that championship for so long. Um, all of Mustache Mountain are all Midlands boys. So I've loved that. Um, I went to actually see NXT UK um, TV tapings last year um, in February, and that was amazing. Um, I've, been really, I've been really happy that we've got to see some British wrestlers on a much larger stage. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, the, the card is looking pretty stacked. Uh, and if you watch their kind of preview show on the network this past Thursday, it's really got me excited for a lot of the matches and a lot of the talent that we're going to see in uh, Blackpool on Sunday afternoon. But uh, back to yourself then, Fal. So you are very active on social media, on Twitter in particular. Uh, you've got an excellent YouTube channel uh, called Foul Original. I know you, you dabble in one or two other channels as well, and you're a prolific podcaster. You're, you're a prolific guest on other people's podcasts like this one here. Uh, but uh, when did podcasting and YouTube start for you? When did you first get interested in doing it? How long have you been doing it for? And tell us a little bit about your channels. Sure. Um, so I've been going for like about, well, I started in 2016. Uh, in 2016, in the, uh, it was just before, it would have been September 2016. And during that time, I made a video. Um, I made a few videos. I was really inspired by WrestleMania, who I had a chance to speak to last year. And it was like absolutely insane. But I made a, YouTube, a few YouTube videos. I made one about Roman Reigns getting booed. Uh, I made one about uh, Titus O'Neil when he did the push uh, to Vince McMahon. Yeah. And then I did one called Top 10 Wrestlers Who Murdered Someone. That one went <laughs> crazy. In about the space of like two days, it picked up like 100,000 views. And that was my third video uh, on my YouTube channel. And I was like, oh, my God, this is it. This is what i got to do. Um, the next video got 10 views. So, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I was uh, at the time I was in a relationship and that relationship t around about the same time that Foul Original appeared, um, that relationship ended. That was 2016. Um, and then at that time I had some changes in my life, got a new job, did a few bits and pieces. Then I came back. I did um, I did stuff on Periscope, which is a live streaming platform, which people have probably seen. Um, and I was very, very lucky to do random videos about nothing with my phone. And I left Periscope with a million and a half likes. Wow. Um, 
and it was in again insane um i got chance to get insulted by every single person on my appearance because uh i looked fo- i looked weird and <laughs> and that's all it was it was toughening up my skin um and then i came back here in 20 funnily enough i came back to my channel i am um, in 2018 i did a live stream for the royal rumble off my phone on youtube and that picked up like 20,000 views and i was like i'm just sitting here on my phone like in the living room um maybe i could do something with this and started doing the live show on a weekly basis every sunday um and since then it's just been just collaborating with the wrestling community uh end of 2018 is where I made, I say to people, I made a nuisance of myself on wrestling Twitter, an absolute nuisance of myself, to the point where people, I didn't just talk up the name foul around the water cooler, I gave everyone a glass of water. I like, I literally went around and filled up every single person's glass and I said, hey, do you know about this foul original guy? That's me. And um, <laughs> by the start of 2019, um, I started working with other people. I was very, very fortunate to, funnily enough, this time last year, I did a live stream for NXT TakeOver, I think it was Blackpool, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ha- I was quite lucky to have Omega Luke on the show, Conrad from Everything Pro Wrestling, uh, Name Redacted, Will from Bray Buster, and we had an amazing roundtable, the first one I'd ever done. And on that night, in January 2019, I reached 1,000 subscribers, and I was like, that's it. I'm going to do stuff now. And uh, it's kind of been from there. Sorry, it's been from there. Uh, I mean, because you've got, what, uh, 3,700 subscribers on YouTube now. So it has gone up even more since 12 months ago when you hit your 1,000 mark. So, uh, I mean, how do you think you've done it? I mean, you, you, you cover a lot of wrestling companies. I mean, you cover AEW, WWE, NXT, all the usual stuff. You've recently done a, a live stream of uh, New Japan, which went over five hours, I think. Uh, so you do cover yeah. a lot of different wrestling uh, companies and a lot of content in general. Um, how do you think you've built up your audience? Uh, I mean, is it because you, you push out regular top quality content? You cover a lot of different topics. What do you think has been the, the, the secret sort? I think it's a mix of all of those things you've just said. I think it's on YouTube especially, and it's something that people forget about. It's all about the algorithm. Like, it's all about the algorithm. And people speak about it like it's a sentient being, and it kind of is. Like, you got to feed it. So I have a show which, and this is something I challenged myself to do, making videos, I'm quite perfection-y about it. So if it's something that's going out and I have to listen to my voice and I have to cut around, it might take me weeks. If it's live, I've got to put it out. It's too late. Like, what can you do? Like, it's live. So I've um, I've put out that content every week. YouTube recognizes I do that every week. Sometimes I'll talk about topics. I talk about topics that are interesting to me. Sometimes they happen to kind of cross over with what's popular right now. Um, And I think part of it has been the collaboration. I truly, truly believe that having a chance to work with other content creators, having a chance to have conversations with people that you wouldn't necessarily have, having a chance to have differing opinions, um, I think that's part of the secret sauce. Also, it's been um, connecting with my audience. Like my audience, and I said this in the pre-chat, is I want to make a show that I'd want to watch. And... If I don't want to watch it, then why would anyone else want to watch it? So I think that's where I've come from. Like the first weekly wrestling recaps, which is the live show I do, were done from my bed. Like if you go back and watch the first episodes, like I'm literally in my bed. And like obviously now I've got like green screen and stuff. But that would be like something pops up on the left hand side, something pops up on the right hand side. And I'd point to it and I'd be like, this is hilarious. This thing's on the screen. That was part of what I was doing. Um, I think that, again, I've been quite lucky as well that Fight have been really, really helpful. Fight TV, and big mm. shout out to them. They're really nice people. Last night, um, they, we had an issue with, with something behind the scenes, and they worked their asses off for an hour to get it working for me before I went to bed. Um, and uh, also, people like Brain Buster was a really big thing for us. Um, and it's, it's just working with people like yourself. I think that by... I made a promise to myself last year that I wanted to do, I wanted to be on as many different podcasts as possible. And I think that I kind of achieved part of that. But um, for people out there that are looking to get that, hit that next level, all I can say is collab, um, be consistent and have fun when you're doing what you're doing. People will know when you're not having fun. They'll see it straight away. And you talk about those five hour streams. Um, 
I was doing the five hour stream and then a recap afterwards. The recap was where you could tell I I was like dead. It was like six <laughs> hours of me just looking at a screen. And it's like, yeah, so the things that just happened on this show, I'm ever so sorry, but it's six in the morning and I've forgotten all the matches. Um, I think that's part of it, but having a good co-host um, and just having fun, just have fun, guys. Like the most important thing is if you have fun, people will see that and they will want to see you have more fun. Yeah, and I, I found that it's important that you don't need to know everything in wrestling. You don't need to know all the names, all the moves, all the shows. But as long as you're having fun, you, you, your fans or your listeners will enjoy it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all about the connection you have with your listeners. And uh, I totally agree with what you're saying there. But uh, making a nuisance of yourself on Twitter is something I also agree with. Uh, because if you're a shrinking violet, not putting out posts, not uh, liking, retweeting, or getting involved in a conversation, then people aren't going to know you're out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's the po that's the point. Like it is, if as long as you and even if you just pop in, like with me, I wasn't sure what to say, and in that first period of time, so 2018, so my nuisance was gifts. Now gifts, gifts. I'm sorry if I offended anyone, but gifts. Yeah. So like all I did was I did. And I was really lucky to find like a British subsection of wrestling Twitter, and those are people like Paul Tolly, Mags. Big shout out to Mags. I love you, Mags. Yeah, like, I love Mags. Save. Kept me sane last year, but Mags, um, Paul Tolly, uh, if all the guys of Five Nerds go, like MGB Graham, like all these Brits. So I could make jokes about Alan Partridge that, like, the Americans have no idea what the hell I was talking about, but the Brits are like carrying on with it, and I found comfortableness in that. And uh, I think that's it. Like people, p people, when you're a wrestling fan, that's not your only fandom. Like, you will like other things, and something that Cody does quite well is Cody Rhodes will put a message out, like the new Picard series that's coming out, like I'm a big Star Trek fan, and he'll put a message out going like, I think it looks really good, what do you guys think? And that's nothing to do with wrestling, that's absolutely nothing to do with wrestling, but it engages fans, and it's another chance for people to say, I don't know a lot about, say, New Japan, like I'm not a, an expert on New Japan, but if someone's talked to me about New Japan, I could tell them about like you know the connection to AEW where I started watching New Japan and I would rather someone educate me on it and tell me that hey you pronounce that name hilariously wrong than, uh, than someone to say to me oh yeah you're doing everything right oh yeah cool yeah go for it like it's um I think one thing that I've learned uh massively over last year is and as you've just said you can't know everything you no, cannot no. know everything and it's the second that you're comfortable with that you'll have really good you'll have such fun time yeah well i'm so glad that i had some good co-hosts during my uh, night one and night two reviews of Re wrestle kingdom 14 because i did butcher quite a few of the wrestlers names to be honest with you and uh, they, they they did correct me or uh, uh, maybe say it uh, how it should have been said so that i could follow suit later on in the in the commentary but uh, my wrestle kingdom reviews of night one and night two are up on my archive if any of my listeners fell want to uh, get in touch with you or watch any of your stuff where can they find you what what social media platforms uh, or what uh, podcast platforms are you on and uh, kind of where can they find you so um the youtube channel youtube.com search foul original wrestling is the place you'd want to go to to start with because um you can also find me on twitter at foul underscore original on the twitters i do giveaways for loads of different stuff thanks to fight tv so i've got a giveaway going on for nwa hard times at the moment and a few other bits and pieces um but the audio side see that's where um i'm kind of lacking sometimes uh, i'm quite lazy so if you go to linktree.ee, link we all know the one, linktree slash foul original, you can find loads of links to the foul original podcast. Now it goes out in audio form sometimes. Uh, and the, the, the best way to get it, the best way to catch the show though, is try and catch it live on YouTube. Um, yes. I, uh, I also have Remote Wrestling, which I've got some more content to put up, which is um, a show which was a lot more about my geekery and like fandoms of other stuff. And we talk about TV uh, and niche, nondescript stuff. Uh, and I had people like uh, Dave Hancock from Wrestling Travel. I had WrestleMania on there. Um, and that's over on my other Twitter, which is at Remote Wrestling. Um, but those are probably the best places to check me. Uh, I, I'm on Instagram as well, obviously, but my link tree is the best place to go to, and that's all available on um, 
of Twitter, but I do have a website, not as good as yours. I have to say, I've checked your website out. <laughs> and my you. God, well done. Well done, because... Well, all credit to one of my sons there. They, they put it together in a couple of months, but it does look pretty good. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> it, looks really good. it looks really good, and it's something that I wanted to do in the future, but instead, my website is just my face and, like, some little, like, random links, but... Um, that's where you can go to check out some other bits and pieces that I have. But um, I'm looking to maybe this year start putting out some more written content. Um, but right now it is my videos. Um, and yeah, like once we hit this year and we're back into kind of mania season, I'm going to be doing a lot more in the way of collaborations with people. And those will all be available in audio content up on and on my audio side. I'm on iTunes. I'm on Podbean. I'm on Spotify. I'm on all those places. Search for Foul Original Podcast and there'll be some new stuff coming up very, very soon. Awesome. And I'll make sure that your link tree address is up in the description of this podcast so people can click and uh, find you in all them places. But uh, yeah, I've got to say your your YouTube stuff is is phenomenal. So uh, congratulations there. But uh, switching topics slightly, um, wrestling still, but uh, Tell me a little bit about how you become a wrestling fan then, Fel. So, so kind of what, what was uh, some of your earliest recollections of clamping your eyes on this lovely sport that we that we all enjoy? And uh, tell me a little bit about the, the early years of your wrestling fandom. So um, I've been a wrestling fan for a long ass time. <laughs> like, Same. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think I think a lot of us, it's it's really similar. Like we're both in the UK, so my wrestling fandom kind of peaked during the year 1999 and 2000. Um, that's when over here in the United Kingdom, we had wrestling on mainstream terrestrial TV on Channel 4. Like it did happen before, like, and that's where my fandom kind of starts. Um, back in the late eighties, uh, very late eighties, uh, like 88, 89, I watched um, a few WrestleMania um, tapes, and I used to watch them on tape, VHS. Some one of my cousins would come round, pop on a VHS, um, we'd watch matches and we'd watch bits and pieces. And that's kind of where it started. Um, wrestling, because we didn't have satellite at home, was always something which was you'd watch it at someone else's house while yeah. you had to be there. Um, like when SmackDown first aired, I remember it was on Sky One and it would come on on Sky One. And I can remember specifically saying, hey, mom, can we go visit like my gra my granddad? Can we go visit granddad? I'm For no particular reason. <laughs> like, that was fun. You guys want to talk about stuff. That's I'm just going to sit here and uh, just, just watch the TV. And I can vividly remember my, it was my granddad's <laughs> little brother. And he saw China on the screen and he goes, is that is that is that going to be your wife in the future? And I was like, oh, thanks, dude. He was like, she's ever so strong. She's going to knock you out. And I was like, and at the time, I would have been like about nine, ten, maybe. Actually, no, I would have been a little bit later. We were definitely older than that. But he was uh, he was desperate to marry me off to China. But um, I uh, so that was that. I, I watched WCW stuff um, when it came to the year two thousand, two thousand one. My wrestling fandom exploded, and I had a Dreamcast. And using my Dreamcast, I could download wrestling stuff and I could watch it on my Dreamcast. So I watched the first TN NWA TNA pay-per-view on the oh, Thursday. Um, I, was, I was part of, um, and I don't know if anybody knows about these, but wrestling news groups. So I used to be part of the pro wrestling news group on alt.binaries.pro wrestling. And I, <laughs> I just chat just chat on there and you could download stuff so i would watch um tna every week so i watched the first show with uh ken shamrock winning that gauntlet becoming the first champ and i was like this show is insane so every single week i was watching that i was watching shoot promos i was listening to shoot interviews at the same time uh, the wrestling channel started over here um, in the UK on satellite and then I did have satellite and I was able to watch big um, I was able to watch New Japan over here Bravo was showing ECW they also showed random bits of UK stuff um, but my wrestling fandom just exploded in 2001 I took a bit of a break in 2006 ish I think we all have at one point or another because, uh, yeah, like I say, life happens, uh, you grow up, you find other things to do. And, uh, yeah, I, I took a break for about six years. Yeah, and then I, I was still, but I think it was still something where I knew everything that was happening. So I was still mm. a general wrestling fan. I'd still catch every year's WrestleMania. Um, I'd still watch bits and pieces. And then I think that it was 2010, 11, roughly, and I say this, it was roughly when Punk was back on the scene and he I kind of took a slight break again 
and then Punk did the um the, his promo pipe, pipe bomb. bomb pipe bomb hit and I was back and I was back like fully back I couldn't not watch it I remember being really out feeling out of the loop because I heard about the pipe bomb afterwards then I went back and watched that episode of Raw and I was like this is really weird there's something going on here like because I remember hearing about the invisible arrows and stuff and I was like I don't know and I got to the end and I was like you know the rest of the show was was trash but this last segment I'm sold I want to watch this match. I'm really into this. Punk goes away. I'm still into this. And that took me back because obviously then I started looking at ROH again and all those different promotions. Um, and uh, I started falling in love with Japanese wrestling again. But it was hard to find anywhere which was showing it in English, um, like quickly. And I think I got into New Japan around the time that Jeff Jarrett did, I think it was Wrestle Kingdom 10. And he had um, GFW co-presented New Japan and he had Jim Ross there doing live commentary. And that was it. I was into New Japan. I was like, so it's um, I think with me, um, I've been very, very open to any kind of wrestling. I don't I don't have a particular I, I, I don't have a particular allegiance to any wrestling. I have allegiance to the wrestlers. And I have allegiance to the the product that I'm seeing on screen. So like uh, like nowadays, I watch wrestling in maybe a like slightly different way, but I could still watch NWA Power, and that gives me that like butterfly feeling, that kind of like I don't know what's going to happen, and it's all warm. It's like it's like I'm drinking a coffee now. It's like drinking a Horlicks, like a beautiful Horlicks. Watching NWA, okay, other other hot drinks are available, but drinking <laughs> a beautiful Horlicks, yeah, and uh, it's it's really comfortable and it's really inviting, and I think that's kind of where my journey has gone along to, really. Yeah, they're producing a fantastic product, and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the Power Show every Tuesday on YouTube. And you, you've covered a lot of ground there. You, you've obviously made it clear that you're a wrestling fan of uh, pretty much most of the mainstream um, wrestling promotions around at the moment. Uh, you mentioned about wrestlers, dummies. What, what are some of the wrestlers that kind of get you tuned in that really turn you on to the product nowadays, NFL? Well, of all time, um, and this happened around 2000, my favorite wrestler of all time is Rob Van Dam. Rob Van Dam has always had a place in my heart and um, I've started watching Impact because of Rob Van Dam. Like I took a bit of time away from Impact and I've started watching it on occasion because of him um, and other wrestlers that really get me into it. Um, I think that um, what's being like the elite. I follow the elite since 2016. Funnily enough, about the same time that my channel started, um, and I was watching what they were doing on being the elite, and I was like, "These guys are awesome. I've seen these guys before." Kenny Omega will make me. He, he, whatever he's wherever he goes, I'll want to see what he's doing. Um, the books, and also um, Cena to an extent. Whenever there's a Cena match, even though it's John Cena, I want to see what he's going to bring to the table, like something different. Punk, I followed him around for quite a long time. Um, trying to think of other wrestlers. Um, Okada, Kazuchika Okada has truly, like, I saw, I remember watching him in TNA um, when he was Kato, and I was like, I don't know who this guy is. I know, and like, that's the thing, yeah? We all saw him as Kato, and I thought, <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. Obviously, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's like, as whatever, and that. He like he drew me into it. Samoa Joe, I freaking love Samoa Joe, and he's been another guy who, as as a slightly rotund individual, uh, he has given me hope, <laughs> hope so many times. And I remember watching him in TNA when he first started, and seeing him now, like I'm like the stuff he was doing on commentary, that was making me tune in. Um, and then uh, female wrestlers wise, like Trish, like a lot of Trish Stratus, Lita. Um, obviously, I just like age myself there. Um, but there are, I also have like a massive amount of respect for um, all of the women's divisions right now. Paige used to really make me turn into the show because I want to see what she did. AJ Lee. Um, but like nowadays, it's it's hard to maybe find anyone that would probably turn up on a wrestling show. John Morrison turning up on SmackDown. I'm gonna watch. I haven't watched SmackDown yet, but I know that last night uh, he had a little bit more of a flurry. Um, but I'm gonna watch that. He he does. Um, I, I think these days, especially wrestlers that haven't been in the WWE or haven't had a chance, someone that has been making me tune in and I never thought they would was Aaron Stevens. From NWA Power, yeah. 
he has absolutely changed. Like, he, I remember thinking that, like, he said he was going to come back to wrestling. He said he was going to come back to NWA, uh, to a, a, a professional wrestling show. We didn't know which one. And when he did come back, I was like, oh, my God, he's amazing. He, this is, this is where he should have been the whole time. Um, and there's loads. There's absolutely loads. Yeah, and once again, NWA Power has been one of them revelations that's really allowed certain talents to, to flourish. It's given that old style studio feel as well. What's your thoughts on, on Marty Skrull um, turning up in NWA, uh, certainly at their last pay per view, Into the Fire? Um, it, it, some people are saying it's maybe a short term thing, could it be a long term thing? He seems quite comfortable there, he seems a good addition as well, Fel. Uh, what's, your, what's your kind of long term thoughts on Marty Skrull, where he might end up, or is he staying in NWA? So I think Marty Skrull, I think that's such an that is such an interesting individual. Um, for again, British guy, he has had chance to go around everywhere, really build his brand, and um, I think that what he's done in NWA Power, I think that that was amazing. I think that him turning up there, no one expected it. That's like the ultimate. I remember sitting there watching the show, and I did a watch along for it, and. I'm watching the show and we were just generally talking about people and Nick Aldis does his thing. He's in the ring and he's doing it. And then I heard the noise and I heard like the squawks and I was like, no, why would he be here? Why would he? Oh my, oh my God, that's Marty's girl. And uh, he, and uh, like, that was, I think, as you said, the perfect person to be there. Like that is the perfect old school kind of guy. The history he has with Aldis as well from them coming up together. Um, I think that really adds to a story. But Especially nobody now... predicted it, did they? Nobody predicted it, but it's like you say now that it's happened, it's a perfect fit. Everybody was expecting him to go to AEW, of course, to join his friends. Which I think is great, which, which I think is something that is missing from wrestling now. I think Absolutely. we all knew, we all knew when the elite were, you know, they were all coming up to the end of their time, they were all coming up to the end of their contract. We all knew that they were going to stick together because they'd said that on many an occasion. People had rumours of All Elite happening because we knew that potentially it was going to be happening and so when January rolled around there was no real big surprise that they were all starting this show but Marty because he was still on the ROH contract he almost became like this Sting legendary figure like where's he going to maybe he's going to the WWE to hang out with his girlfriend maybe he's going to go here to do this we don't know and I think that is something that's missing in wrestling so I think that if we talk about long term short term I think in the short term, definitely another title match against Aldis, um, especially now that he's super duper healing it up. Um, I think that would be great. Uh, long term, though, what I'd love to see with him would be just to turn up in places because he said on many an occasion, oh, that was the noise. That was my green screen coming down. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, um, I think that the cool thing that he can do is he can turn up anywhere. Like he could literally turn up anywhere to the point where I think he could turn up on NXT the way that James Storm did yes. when James Storm just rocked up for like one taping turned up he was in he was out and it was done and I think that he could do that he could literally spend this year in every single promotion like he could just pop it he could pop into Impact I'm sure they'd be happy for him to pop in for a little bit he could pop into AEW I'm 100% sure that they'd be happy for him to pop in for a little bit um the storyline which is going on with um, the uh, the Dark Order in AEW, I think that that could probably work as well. Mm. Like he could maybe be the Exalted One, like, exactly. possibly. Yes, you know, there's so much. I think there's there's so many places, and with Skrull as well, is he? I think he's the ad the adaptation, like the way that he could adapt. Uh, like his character doesn't necessarily have like it is the villain. But it isn't necessarily that he's a bad guy or a good guy. Like he's he is the ultimate tweener. Yeah. Uh, long term, I don't think that he's going to stick around in power. But I I know that sorry in NWA. But I know that they filmed stuff with him up to the pay per view, and I'm guessing that that may be where he he just parts ways, but pops in every now and then. Yeah, it's a really intriguing storyline, isn't it? And, and kind of character development for Marty Skrull because he could pop up anywhere. Like I say, 2020 could be his year where he could spend a month or two here, a month or two there. It would make him even more in demand, uh, an even more bigger name. And when it does come to him settling down somewhere, you know, the, the, the bucks could be even uh, higher in his favour um, because of the, the value that he's kind of brought to his name and his reputation by going from place to place. But uh, let's move on slightly then. 
uh, foul. Uh, let's talk about another big superstar that's really uh, kind of caught the attention of, uh, of, of, of wrestling uh, newscasters and podcasters and uh, Twitter uh, wrestling this week, and that's Brock Lesnar. For those of you that watched Monday Night Raw on Monday, it was announced in the opening segment of Monday Night Raw that uh, Brock, or Paul Heyman, his advocate, uh, announced on behalf of Brock that Brock will be entering the Royal Rumble this year, 2020. I think it's January the 26th uh, in uh, Houston, Texas. And what's so intriguing about that is, I mean, Brock Lesnar doesn't need to be in the Royal Rumble. He's already the WWE champion. Uh, he's already going to be headlined in WrestleMania. We know that. But not only has he entered himself into the Royal Rumble, but he's, he's on behalf of uh, Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman mentioned that Brock will be going in as the very first entrant. So it's really got a lot of people thinking and fantasy booking and lots of tongues wagging about why it's happened, what uh, potential matchups you could see. I mean, potentially if Brock's in there, from one all the way through to when the 30th entrant comes out. You could see him in, in matchups against, uh, I don't know, dream matchups against Drew McIntyre, Braun Strowman. You could see an appearance from some NXT competitors. Imagine if Matt Riddle came out and he had a face to face with Brock Lesnar. Keith Lee, that would just blow the roof off the place. Uh, if, if it's got a roof at all, I'm not sure whether they're uh, in a dome or arena. Uh, but uh, what's your thoughts on this big break in? And I think this is, this is possibly the biggest news to come out of wrestling in the last seven days. Days. Brock Lesnar going into the Royal Rumble, announcing that he's going to be the very first entrant and uh, all the potential fantasy opponents that he could have in that hour in the ring. Um, I think that it's crazy. Like, um, I was on uh, Heel Pops and Chair Shots on Wednesday. Big shout out to you boys. Mm. Um, like, uh, and we talked about this and I, I speculated this. If Brock Lesnar wins the Rumble, can he challenge himself? Wow. <laughs> like, can he? Is he allowed to? Like, because he can go for any championship. So if he challenges himself and then doesn't show up for his own match, does he, like, default the title to the other person who is also him? So he doesn't lose the title, <laughs> but he doesn't, like, like, this. like, I love, I love Heyman. And I think that he could really, like, tie this whole thing up in knots. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. But, um... Going in at number one, like, that's a statement, really, isn't it? That's a statement of intent. That's like a, like the only time that we see wrestlers go, I'm going to be number one and I'm going to last the whole thing, is we had that with Shawn Michaels. We've had that with, a, sometimes it's a, um, like a badge of honor and sometimes it's a punishment. It's like, you're going in at number one. Like, um, and number one is such an interesting number in the Rumble. The whole thing, though, I think, like, it's really intriguing because Lesnar is renowned for having, like, five-minute matches, yeah? Like, get his match done, get in the fudge out. Like, so, like, he's going to have to... Sp in theory, he could have be in the rumble for the... As you said, for, like, a whole hour. Like, he could be in that match. That could be an hour long. The longest... We could have more minutes in the WWE ring for Brock Lesnar in one match in the beginning of 2020 than we could have for the whole duration of 2019. Like... That's crazy. Um, something that the guys at HPC said is that maybe this could be a rumble where he just kills everyone. Where he just goes in, 20 minute rumble, people come out every two minutes and he just destroys them. Um, but I think that more likely this match is going to be somewhere where Cain Velasquez gets involved. We're probably this match is setting up for a mania match. This match is setting up for someone to come in, take Lesnar out, Maybe when he's not paying attention, um, and that's what's going to happen. I I don't think that Lesnar is going to win the Rumble, but then that's exactly why he would win the Rumble. <laughs> like, um, so I'm um, I think that it's a really interesting choice. It definitely makes the Rumble match exciting. Like, I think that you know, there's no doubt in the world. Every single person is going to want to watch that Rumble match because they're going to want to see what happens. Uh, I think also placement in the night. I think that that match would go on first. Like, I truly yeah. think that that match would be the first match of the night. Um, and I think that like for it's it's a, it's definitely a statement of intent from Vince, I think as well, and maybe even from Brock in some way, shape, or form. Um, after all the matches that have gone on at, say, Wrestle Kingdom, maybe this is Brock's hour-long match. Maybe this is his Broadway, like, for the year. Um, but, but yeah, it's a really weird decision. Well, it's added 
quite a bit of intrigue into the Royal Rubble match. Now, I mean, I've gone on record as saying the Royal Rubble match is probably my most favourite gimmick match every single year. I look forward to it, uh, the show as a whole, but the, the, the Royal Rubble matches. I was over the moon when they introduced it, the women's Royal Rumble match two years ago, and they've been a great yeah. success as well. But straight off the bat, this announcement on Monday night has made this year's Royal Rumble a must-see event. Um, and it's going to help subscriptions and buy rates, I'm sure. But whereas, you know, maybe Royal Rumble matches, when you think about it, and when you watch them, they're there for the surprise entrance. They're there for, you know, the shock value, the fantasy booking. You know, what would happen if this person won? What would happen if this person came out? But they've never really delivered properly. You've had some pretty, you know, dud Royal Rumble matches in the last 10 years, let's be honest. But this one straight off the back. And if you look at the, you know, some of the initial uh, entrants as well, we obviously know about Brock, but you've got Randy Orton that's uh, announced himself as the Rumble. Drew McIntyre. Uh, Ricochet, AJ Styles, you've got uh, all the top names that's going into this match. It's very rem reminiscent of when we had that 1992 Rumble when all the top names were in there. It was the match with all the names. And uh, it's kind of got that feel and that vibe to it, kind of going back, what, nearly 30 years ago, 1992, when you had, you know, the, the championship is on the line now. The championship, it's not been announced yet, but the championship is not going to be on the line in this match. Um, but do you kind of echo my sentiment, say that, you know, with the, the the entrance that have been announced already, this one's going to be an exciting one. And absolutely. And that, that's what I was going to say. I think this is one of, for, for, for a long time, this is probably one of the most star-studded rumbles mm. where anyone could win. Like, you know, there's been so many years when it's like, send in the job squad, send in the job squad. Okay, they're only there to go out. Like, but this year, I, I truly believe that anyone could win that rumble. Like, and it wouldn't feel out of place. But do you know what I mean? Like, I think this is one of the first years where I think that we could have anyone that could win it because they've been built so well. And also with Heyman being in charge of Raw, I think that it brings a little bit more. I think that we're going to see a Raw winner. Um, but of course, as well with, you know, SmackDown happening and now being on Fox and everything, I think that maybe there might be a push from Fox to have the Smack, a SmackDown superstar be the winner. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like, this is definitely one of those, this, this almost in a way reminds me of like those rumbles from 99, 2000, like 98 kind of thing, where it's like every single person is a massive star. Yeah. And you watch the matches, not to see people get eliminated, but it's like, oh, could they do it? Could they do it? Could they do it? Will it be a Milan miracle tonight? Will it? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you brought up Cain Velasquez because uh, we haven't heard anything from him since he lost that match in oh, was it two minutes to Brock Lesnar in, in Saudi Arabia. And that was uh, a real letdown, a real disappointment. But uh, I've got a feeling they're keeping Cain Velasquez on the back burner to kind of reheat him, to build him back up. And it's interesting that you brought him up as a possible person that, that might potentially be an opponent for Brock at WrestleMania. So that leads me to believe that he's going to be in the Rumble match and he could be the one to, uh, to put him over the top rope. So uh, lots of interesting things. And I think that we're what about uh, two two weeks away from? Uh, is that only two weeks away from the Rumble? Wow, that's going to yeah. come around quick, isn't yeah. it? It's going to come around really quick. Uh, straight into the new year, get Wrestle Kingdom out of the way. Straight into the Royal Rumble. Um, but uh, yeah, the Royal Rumble will be here in two weeks' time. So uh, we're going to see some pretty fast development as far as matches are concerned being announced uh, for the Rumble and more and more entrance into the Rumble itself uh, but the, the focus is going to be Brock Lesnar uh, when that bell rings at the beginning of that 30-man Rumble for sure. Let's move on then Fel, let's talk a little bit about this week's NXT. Uh, so this week's show started with new NXT Women's Champion Rhea Ripley coming into the ring for an in-ring promo. Uh, Rhea gets on the mic. Uh, Rhea talks about memories. She talks about the memories of celebrating on the shoulders of her fans. Uh, then Rhea is interrupted by former NXT UK Women's Champion Tony Storm. Tony said that she's proud of Rhea, uh, but Tony reminds Rhea of the two times that she's defeated her. Uh, then Tony tells Rhea that TakeOver Blackpool, she'll become the next NXT UK Women's Champion, and then she'll go on to challenge Rhea Ripley Ripley herself at the Worlds Collide show uh, to be a double champion, of course. That uh, replaces TakeOver the night before uh, the Royal Rumble. So that's going to be the 25th of January in a couple of weeks' time. 
Then we get Kaylee Ray. Uh, she comes out to enter the discussion. She tells Tony that there's no way that Tony will be taking the title off of her uh, on Sunday, uh, take over Blackpool. Uh, Io Shirai is the next uh, wrestler to come out. She cuts a promo in Japanese before saying that uh, the NXT title will be hers. Uh, Bianca Belair comes out to tell everybody that she's better than all of them. Then we get Candice LeRae, but before Candice uh, could say anything, uh, uh, we get Ripley. She turns and blasts Bianca Belair with the right hand. We then get an announcement of a six-woman tag team match uh, between all of these six competitors to kick this week's show off. So there's plenty do to digest here, Val, from this opening segment. And uh, I thought it was a pretty solid segment from six of the best, six of uh, you know the cream of the crop of the women's division in NXT and NXT UK, you could say. Uh, give us your thoughts on this opening segment to this week's NXT then, buddy. So, uh, so as I've said before, like I, uh, I watch AEW live um, on Dynamite every week. With NXT, I will watch segments afterwards. Um, I don't like today is normally my day that I'll try and watch NXT. Um, and for that segment, I, again, I have to totally echo your sentiments. Um, they are probably six of they would they are my like SmackDown six, like they are my SmackDown six are probably the top women's talent that are through NXT NXT UK right now, yeah. and. Someone like Candice LeRae, we haven't seen everything that she can she can do. You know that that woman has gone out and produced death matches, like crazy death matches as well. Um, I love the way that they're positioning Rhea Ripley as well. Like I love that she's come from nowhere almost in the past six in the past twelve months. Yeah. I'd actually I'd say in the past six months. In the past six months, on that little run up to Survivor Series and everything from that point on, she has been absolutely fantastic and a very believable champion absolutely believable champion and believable someone that can move on to the rest of um like the main roster mm. but um, I, I i think that having something like that and like having matches where we're getting to see like, i think that's and it's it's the my comparison to aew has always been this the aew women's division doesn't really exist the NXT women's division is always on fire. Like, there is not, like, the AEW women's division, it does exist, and, like, you know, we get to see good matches, but it doesn't feel like its own division. They feel like exhibition matches. They just feel like matches that are happening. But there is a story within everything that happens within NXT and NXT UK. But that segment, yeah, I was down for it. Like, again, it was fire. I'll watch. Yeah, it was yeah, really good. I, uh, I, every, every week, sorry, sorry. I say every week that I don't watch NXT. Like it's really interesting because I'll see on Twitter what's going on. I'll be like, "Oh my god, this mad segment's going!" I'm gonna watch that later. I'm gonna watch it later. Yeah, it's must see TV. And this match was a lot of fun. It all breaks down between teammates in the end when Belair tags herself in when Shirai was about to hit a trademark moonsault on Tony Storm. Shirai then nails her own partner Belair with a springboard dropkick before walking out on her team and walking out on the match. This allows Ripley to drop Belair with a riptide finisher for the pinfall victory. After the match, we see Candice LeRae take a good hard look at Rhea Ripley's championship belt before the babyface team celebrates in the ring. So this was a really good opener. Um, and then the second match of the night was the first match in the first round of the Dusty Rose Tag Team Classic. Um, and this, this pits uh, NXT UK favourites, Imperium, Fabian Eichner, Marcel Bartel going up against uh, the Forgotten Sons. Now, my viewpoint on the Forgotten Sons is uh, that they've shown a more vicious side um, to their character and to their wrestling style over recent matches on TV. However, Imperium will always be my favourites in any match. Uh, a quick question for you then, Fel. So, can you remember the previous four winners of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic? Put you on the spot here, I know. The classic, the, the, four, the four winners of the Dusty's yeah, Classic? Yeah, previous oh, winners. Ah, uh, okay. I, I feel like... Um, uh, I feel like Mustache Mountain won once. I feel like oh, they did. No, no. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook here. Okay. So the first winners were uh, Samoa Joe and Finn Balor. I think that was back in 2016. Oh, and then of eight, it was, wasn't it? It yeah, was sorry, indeed, yeah. yeah. So they were a bit of a makeshift team that kind of won the whole thing uh, four years ago. Then AOP won it in 2017. I think they defeated uh, TM61 in the final there. So a bit of a, a forgettable uh, Dusty Classic, you could say. In 2018, Undisputed Era uh, won that 
that was that uh, very memorable match. I think it was a three-way match uh, where Roderick Strong turned on Pete Dunne at TakeOver New Orleans. I was there. It was a fantastic moment. And then oh, last yeah. year's winners, it was another makeshift team of Alistair Black and Ricochet uh, won last year's Dusty Rose Tag Team Classic. This match was hard hitting with uh, Eichner and Bartel. They nearly had the match won from their assisted brain buster uh, from the pair of them. Uh, some outside interference had prevented Imperium from hitting their European bomb for the first time round. But after some excellent tag team action for both teams, it was Eichner and Bartel from Imperium who managed to uh, connect well with their power bomb, flying European uppercut. I think they, they call it the European bomb, the European bomb for the pinfall victory uh, to advance to the next round of the Dusty Cup. So did you manage to uh, catch this match? And if so, what were your thoughts on this uh, first first round match? I did watch this match and I did like this match. Uh, the reason I watched this match afterwards is obviously, I think something you're probably going to mention in a bit, some a team which will be turning, turning up next week, which I, my little 12 year old heart was beating so hard for that. Um, but yeah, this match, very very good um i'm a big fan of imperium uh forgotten sons yeah I, I, I good fun match very hard hitting obviously i'll be watching wrestle kingdom this week it had that kind of vibe to it like the proper like hard hitting kick the crap out of each other kind of match yeah, and I think that that's one thing that NXT are trying to get better at. They've always had good tag teams, and they've always produced excellent tag team matches, we know. But their tag team division has been a bit hit or miss sometimes. And I think they're really on a on a good uh, trend at the moment. Uh, you know, you've got Undisputed Era that, that are draped in gold and uh, had a fantastic 2019, as we know. Forgotten Sons are starting to hit their stride. And uh, uh, some of the makeshift teams, one of which we'll talk about very soon. I think I know which one you're on about. But uh, then there was a very funny backstage interview with Matt Riddle uh, giving us the lowdown on how his partnership with Pete Dunne became a thing uh, for the Dusty Classic. Riddle told us uh, how the, the bros awaits, bros awaits, I think he said, uh, were born. Uh, Matt Riddle, uh, th this segment, I think it really gave us an insight into him and his true character. Apparently, he had a he had a scripted promo to start off with, which he said, no, I'm not doing this. Got in touch with Triple H, uh, told Triple H, look, let me do my thing. He did his thing. It was very, very funny. It worked. It sounded like a promo from the mind of uh, the bro himself. Uh, you, you laughed out loud there. You must have got a chuckle out of this one. I did. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. This is the first thing I saw, like, because obviously the way that I watch NXT now, I don't watch it live. So the first thing that I saw on Twitter was how the Broserweights had been like, had turned up. And I saw Matt <laughs> Riddle and I was like, that ain't scripted. Exactly as you said, that ain't scripted. That's Matt Riddle. And I love the fact that his character is a really hard character to kind of nail down. Like you don't really know what he is. But I was hearing him like talk about how the team came together. And I was like, yeah, man, because that's exactly what would happen. You'd go to Pete Dunne and he'd be like, you want to be a tag team partner? <laughs> Whatever, bro. Why don't we call ourselves the Broserweight? So I was like, that is that is it, isn't it? Like, that's exactly, that's the Matt Riddle we wanted to see. That's the Matt Riddle we would never see on the main roster. And I think that, um, oh, sorry, the main roster. And I think that's why it's so cool to have him where he is right now. Um, yeah, man, I'm down for that team as well. <laughs> oh, I'm really definitely. Down for Excellent. And uh, we just hope the same, that history doesn't repeat, because remember the last time Pete Dunne was in his tournament two years ago, as I mentioned, Roderick Strong, his partner for that tournament, turned his back in their final kind of championship match. Um, I don't suspect that Matt Riddle is the type of person to uh, to turn heel on anybody, but you never know. Uh, could Pete Dunne uh, turn turn heel on, uh, on, on, on Matt Riddle? We, we tend to get these kind of conflict of interest with these makeshift teams. But uh, th the second match in the Dusty Rose Tag Team Classic then foul was the Undisputed Era, Bobby Fish, Kylie Riley going up against so, so Undisputed Era, current NXT Tag Team Champions, going up against Gallus, current NXT UK Tag Team Champions, Wolfgang and Mark Coffey, of course. So this should be a really competitive match between two uh, Tag Team Champions of their respective N NXT brand. Uh, and of course, as mentioned earlier, Undisputed Era, a current four-time uh, NXT Tag Team Champions, I think I'm right in saying four-time, and previous Dusty Cup winners, and Gallus will be part of that really exciting uh, four-way, four-team ladder tag team match uh, that's going to be taking place in Blackpool on Sunday. Can't wait to talk more about that match with Fowl a little bit later on. But Fowl, going into this one, what were your thoughts on these two teams? What were your expectations? Obviously, champion versus champion in the opening round of the Dusty Cup. Uh, anything that uh, kind of caught your eye going into this one? Again, it's it's great to see like how much NXT UK has grown in the past year or so, where we're getting to see these matches being featured on NXT 
TV. Um, and I really like the way that this match went down. Like, again, I think that with these first round matches, they're really great exhibition matches to kind of show what people can do. And I, um, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm down for like gang warfare between Undisputed Era and Gallus. I'm down for gang warfare between Undisputed Era, Gallus, Imperium, and like the bros away, just throw them in there, just throw some more bricks in with them. Like, I, like I, I think that we're building to that. Like, and I've seen this happen. Like, it's almost like NXT is slowly building towards some big gang warfare like storyline happening soon. Like a, a true NXT UK versus NXT kind of battle and uh, this gave me like a little almost like a taster of that yeah well i think i think the reason why nxt uk have been included into this year's dusty classic is because of course we've got the the world's collide show in a couple of weeks time taking place the night before the war rumble and that's going to be nxt versus nxt uk so this is a bit of a, a preview into some of the some of the matches or some of the talent that's going to be offer or, or facing across the ring for one another on that uh, very special night in a couple of weeks time uh, but this was another really good match as you would expect from these two excellent tag teams uh we even had nxt champion adam cole get involved and he was uh, especially involved in the finish of this match with Gallus looking particularly strong towards the end. I've got to say, I did think they were going to take it, but it was Adam Cole who struck Wolfgang with an enziguri through the ropes, setting up Fish and O'Reilly to deliver their high-low, chasing the Dragon uh, to win and to advance to the semi-finals of the Dusty Cup. So another good win for the Undisputed Era here. Um, I'm guessing you're a fan of the Undisputed Era. Uh, what did you think of this one? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the Undisputed Era, mainly because I... I've loved these guys for so long. Like, again, I think it's a similar thing with the Elite. Like, um, Redragon followed them when, like, I didn't really get what the Redragon gimmick was when they were in New Japan. But I think once they joined NXT, I was like, oh, that's what they're supposed to. Oh, I get it now. Um, and I love this, like, this force of amazing professional wrestlers that just, you know, they, they are the best like it's not even i think sometimes it's not even a debate like they are the best right now and every time they get to challenge against people that want to be the best and sometimes those people beat them but i, I think that like with the undisputed era i've i've become fans of them because this they remind me of old school wrestlers that would go out there like they remind me of the of the four horsemen they remind me of that team that, yeah, they're sneaky and they cheat, but it's not because they're not good enough. It's because they're dicks. Like, and I think that's what I like about the... But the heels, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, like, you can cheer for them, but they'll do something sneaky and you'll be like, oh, I didn't like that, you sneaky, you cheeky monkey. But you know what? I like you. That they are the ultimate cool heels. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think Undisputed Era, like, they've got so much to give. And they still haven't given yet. I think. I think that's that's the one thing I've got about them. I've got to agree. There's a, a lot more to offer for, for. But I think 2020 could be an interesting year because you know, they spent 2019 on top with all the gold. Um, and, and and you know, you've got to think, what's the future going to hold for? They can't retain their gold for another 12 months. Big things are in the pipeline. I think for Adam Cole, could we potentially see him? on a Raw or a SmackDown. Um, people are, are saying it's more of a sideways shift nowadays that to NXT is just as much of, a, of, of the main roster as uh, the other two. But it'd uh, be interesting to see how they're handled, whether they are moved sideways, upwards, downwards to whichever brand. But uh, I think 2020 is going to be an interesting year for these four, most definitely. But um, uh, the, the next segment I really enjoyed, and I think you probably did as well, and it was uh, Mr. NXT, Mr. Takeover, Johnny Gargano, uh, out next for a promo segment in the ring. Uh, Johnny addresses Finn Balor and said that when Finn Balor got the phone call in 2016, he couldn't wait to drop the flag and go over to Monday Night Raw and leave, whereas Johnny got the phone call in August of last year and he stayed right here on NXT. Johnny says that uh, they, they took... Um, after Finn Balor left, they took NXT to new heights without Finn, and they did need, didn't need Balor to succeed. This then brings out Finn Balor. Um, he calls Gargano Johnny Promo, and uh, that uh, Johnny uh, had cost him the NXT Championship in his match against Adam Cole on December the 18th. Finn calls NXT his chessboard and challenges Gargano to a match at TakeOver Portland in February. And this was, in my opinion, an excellent display of what these two can offer on the microphone. Some fantastic promo skills by both men. It was short, it was effective, they both delivered uh, a very 
personal uh, but effective promo on each other. And uh, this has made me even more excited for their eventual matchup. Of course, it probably would have happened before now had Johnny Gargano not got injured at the back end of last year. But the match is going to take place on February the 18th, I think, is uh, TakeOver Portland. Uh, but give us your thoughts on what you witnessed here. I think both guys knocked it out of the park. Um, again, I think that, like, obviously later on in the evening, other stuff happened. But I think that this was, like, again, was what I love about NXT is that it's so for us sometimes. Like, there are so much. And when I say for us, I mean... Like, it's for the wrestling fans. I think that sometimes Raw and SmackDown have to really kind of try and capture that that mainstream audience. So sometimes the storylines don't, re- like, don't refer back. They, they don't reward you for having spent that time. This whole segment, where there was so... It was... And it's something that's missing from wrestling sometimes. It was... It, it was an opinion but steeped in truth. So it was like, okay, when this all happened, yeah, the, the the NXT brand did go to New Heights after Finn Balor left. Yes, Johnny Gargano did not want to go to the main roster. You mm-hmm. know, like, there was so much in there that you're like, oh, that's that's legit. That's true. And it's this little, 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 this little secret safe garden, the secret garden of the WWE, yeah? and it's, it's NXT and it's great to have someone like Finn Balor come back because you can kind of say, oh, yeah, well, I made it to the top, but I, I made it to the big heights. And then it's like, but I wanted to be back here because this is where the real stuff goes on. Like, it's 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 nice. I, I think that um, and it's believable. It's truly it is believable, believable, yeah. And it's great that they've got that freedom to go that extra mile with these promos and get a little bit personal because uh, I don't think that they yeah. can, but, you know, be, necessarily be given that sort of freedom on uh, the other brands, shall we say. But uh, I thought this really, really worked in it. That, that element of kind of the personal digs um, uh, towards one another really, really worked. And I, I thought that this was uh, possibly promo of the night, um, in my opinion, certainly between the two shows. And we'll get more into AEW a little bit later on. But, um, then we see Mia Yim. She picks up a quick victory over Caden Carter before Yim is blindsided by uh, the returning Chelsea Green. We saw in a match against Charlotte on Raw a couple of weeks ago. But uh, Chelsea Green, accompanied by new manager Robert Stone, and I suppose the, the the official debut of the Robert Stone brand. And then that that leads us nicely into the main event of NXT this week, a fatal four way main event, and it's the number one contenders match. So the winner of this match will become the number one contender for the NXT North American Championship, of course. Uh, held by Roderick Strong, undisputed era member currently. And this is pitting uh, Keith Lee, Damian Priest, Cameron Grimes and Dominic Dijakovic. So Keith Lee and Dijakovic, they had a, a brief moment in the ring, but both knew uh, each other too well to get the better of one another in their exchange. Keith Lee was an absolute monster in this match, like he is in, in all the matches, let's be honest, with Damian Priest. He's using Damian Priest as a weapon, uh, always like a wrecking ball to floor his other two opponents to the canvas. We see Damian Priest uh, nail all three opponents with a, a step up toe pick on Hero uh, to a loud pop. And I love it when he does that for such a big guy uh, to do that move that you would expect from cruiserweights. There's a massive suplex spot from Keith Lee on uh, Damien Priest, followed by a huge moonsault from Dijakovic. Uh, Dijakovic delivers a feast, you'll rise. Lee pounces Dijakovic over the top rope. Priest drops Lee with a reckoning, but Dijakovic pre- uh, prevents the pin with a big boot through the ropes. And that was a really fun sequence of moves there. Grimes nearly had uh, caused an upset with his twisting kind of Spanish fly collision course power slam that he does on Lee. And to do that on such a big guy looked even more effective. The question is whether he should have done it on Keith Lee at all is another question. Um, but, but that was a, a really spirited effort from Grimes. Uh, but it was Keith Lee that finished the match on top with a brutal spirit bomb for the one, two, three on Cameron Grimes. Uh, and this was clearly the match of the night on NXT. Uh, and it will be Keith Lee who will be challenging Roderick Strong for the North American Championship in just two weeks' time. So when you get these four competitors in the ring foul you can't go wrong they're going to deliver every single time we've seen it time and time again but uh, great to see the addition of Cameron Grimes who's a bit of an up-and-coming superstar within NXT definitely delivered um, I thought all four guys gelled and I thought this was an excellent main event and a, a good outcome a good win for Keith Lee but to give us your thoughts on this one buddy so this is this was my like monsters ball this was my like TNA Monsters Ball, this four big old dudes, yeah, four big old dudes that can go, and they go, and, like, 
that's what they did in this match. Um, I think when you were talking about like Keith Lee, you know, the things that he should not be able to do, mm. that's why he's so good. Like taking like that Spanish fly, like, would you expect someone of his size to be even able to take it? I think that that gives him even more stock. Um, I think that so I think Keith Lee said something not that long ago about so people were asking about why he has abs. Like, why does someone of his size have abs? And it's like it's probably because of all the crazy stuff he can actually do. Yeah. Like he's he is a cruise. It's almost like he's a cr- like there's a cruiserweight inside of him. Like there's several <laughs> cruiserweights inside of him that like work pulleys and stuff to do what he does. Because like there's no way he should be able to do any of that. Like I mean. By by science, we look at like Ricochet, and you see what Ricochet can do. You're like, okay, he's a small guy, like stuff. But Keith Lee shouldn't be able to do any of that. And I have so much like, in my in my opinion, I have so much faith in Keith Lee. I have so much. Uh, I I think that he's going to do amazingly. Like you know, you look at him and you think him versus like Lesnar. Like mm. that's a match. That's a money match right there. Oh, yeah. Lesnar as well wouldn't want to be, he'd be no slouch in that match. Lesnar would be like, I'm not letting this guy show me up. And that's what would make the match so good. I think that he'd, because I think Lesnar said before about liking, be, liking to be able to toss people around. Like he likes to be able to throw people like, he'd throw Keith Lee around, but if he wants to, Keith Lee would sell the hell out of it. You know, if he just wanted to lawn dart him across the way. Um, <laughs> but I'd I love to that, see that match. That would be amazing. I, I, that's what I mean, and you know that's the kind of match that you could. I would love to have, say, Keith Lee in the Rumble, and Keith Lee win the Rumble, and then go, "I see you, Brock Lesnar." Like, I, I think that it, it, like that, that's something that could definitely happen. But yeah, this match, very, very happy for it, um, and it's great that we get these kind of matches from NXT, like as a main event as well. Four guys who on the main roster would be just randomly in the middle of the card somewhere, like, and it would be a match that would have five ad breaks in between. Uh, or it would be on the pre-show, uh, and it would be, you know, we wouldn't really talk about it. Uh, I think it was great. Keith Lee going yeah. up against uh, Roderick Strong as well. What a goddamn match that's going to be. Yeah, and I, I think he was involved in a, in a three-way match. Um, I can't remember who the third competitor was. It was probably mm-hmm. Dijakovic and, and Strong. And, was uh, Keith Lee a few, yeah. yeah uh, uh, probably a couple of months back now for the North American Championship. And that was outstanding. And, and Roderick Strong got the clean win there. And I think that uh, when the two of them go head-to-head in two weeks' time, it's going to be phenomenal. Potentially, now that we've got 2019 out of the way, I think uh, we, we, we're might be in need of maybe some new champions, some new holders of that uh, gold. Uh, and um, Keith Lee could be the answer, unless they've got bigger plans for him. Like I say, he could appear in the Royal Rumble. <sighs> Let's be honest, in a couple of years' time, he's going to be kind of headlining uh, some big shows on the main roster because he's, he's got the size, he's got the look, he's got the charisma, he's got the moves for crying out loud. He is the total package. I wouldn't be surprised if Vince McMahon uh, is kind of salivating over what he could do with a guy like Keith Lee. Um, as long as, you know, that they, they don't put him in any stupid storylines, I think, uh, you know, the world is literally Keith Lee's oyster. But I'm um, looking forward to that match in a couple of weeks' time. Before we finish talking NXT, though, Found on next week's NXT, we're going to see a, a women's battle rule to crown the new number one contender to Rhea Ripley's championship, and uh, the winner of that will take on Ripley at Takeover Portland. So potentially Tony Storm could be in in the uh, in the you know in, in the realms of conversation as being a uh, number one contender for the future. Be interesting to see who's in it and who comes out uh, number one. Plus two more opening round matches to the Dusty Rose Tag Team Classic. Matt Riddle and Pete Dunn, the, 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 the bros awaits, taking on Flash Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews. I can't wait to see that match. And the Grizzled Young Veterans taking on, well, a, a team that you might be slightly excited about. Kashida and Alex Shelley uh, reforming the time splitters from their time in uh, New Japan. Of course, two-time uh, IWGP junior uh, heavyweight tag team champions. And Alex Shelley, he kind of made a bit of a, a, a cameo appearance in a coaching role at the WWE PC a couple of months back. Set a lot of tongues wagging as to whether he's signed or whether we're going to see him on TV. The answer is yes, he's going to be teaming with Kushida, um, making his debut next week. Now, I think he made his official debut uh, on a kind of NXT house show appearance last night alongside Kushida. But you're obviously very excited by this news, uh, Foul. Uh, give us your thoughts on, on Alex Shelley in an NXT ring alongside Kushida, the, the time splitters are back together taking on the grizzled young veterans. It's going to be a hell of a match. 
oh my god, like two of my favourite teams going up against each other. <laughs> One of my favourite teams reforming on NXT. Like, ah, uh, so... I um I talked about when I kind of got into New Japan and like my kind of you know wrestling journey and I was a massive TNA fan and I still am to an extent um and one of my favorite teams of all time was the Motor City, Motor City Machine Guns I freaking loved them um like they were to me what wrestling could be and their battles with um beer money absolutely insane for people yeah, that don't know who BMW was, yeah, was James Storm. exactly and they were great James Storm and um, Bobby, Bobby Roode Rude. Bobby Roode, Money, and going up against the Motor City Machine Guns um, then when the Motor City Machine Guns broke up and we got to see Chris Saban go over for that like uh, uh, heavyweight championship title back in TNA and Alex Shelley disappeared now this is kind of when I kind of fell into Japanese wrestling and I was like ooh Alex Shelley is teaming with this Japanese guy who thinks he's Marty McFly and they come out in like the DeLorean and they're time travelers. I don't understand. (laughs) And I was like, let's watch this match. Oh my God. This is just the Motor City Machine Guns, a little bit of Japanese spice. Oh my, this is insane. Like I love this. And uh, seeing Kushida turn up in NXT way back when I remember just thinking like, come on, let's just get Alex here. Like, I know that he's knocking about in the PC somewhere, and they're probably just waiting for this. Uh, I am very... This match, this one match, yeah, and, you know, like, there's that turning of the tide for people in this Wednesday Night War. This one match was like, do I do a live stream of NXT oh, next week? Wow. <laughs> I was like, it's just this one match. I was like, or do I maybe turn over? Like, this is the first real... This truly is the first match that's got, like... Oh, I wonder what they're going to put up against it on AEW <laughs> Dynamite. If it's a promo package, do, do I change the channel? Is this that channel changer moment for me? Like, it really is. Like, it, like it, it really, really is. Um, I'm really conflicted, like, well, this that next would week. Make for, that would make for a good live stream, is, is kind of, you know, just do the whole two hours flicking between the channels. That could work. Yeah, I mean, Wrestling Days has, uh, he does a live stream, and he does both shows at the same time, which I think is just too much. Like, I, I couldn't watch both shows and absorb them both. Um, but I definitely probably want to have, like, two screens up here. I've got my monitor and my laptop. Probably just want to, oh, like, it's, it's made me so happy because the Grizzled Young Veterans, I love them as well. And I think that we're going to get a response similar to um to when Shinsuke Nakamura came out against uh, Sami Zayn and they had that match this match is going to steal the breath and the soul of every single person who watches it in the best way possible and I think that everyone in the arena is going to be spent after this match and I don't know what you put after this match because it's the the NXT faithful will love this like the ones in the arena at full sail. And I think that because of the way that the Grizzly Young Veterans can get that heel heat going, if you send them out there first and you get uh, you get James Drake, you know, showing his ass off because <laughs> he's got his face on his ass and, you know, like all of that stuff. I, I, I think that like... Uh, I, I, I just, I'm just so excited. Yeah. Like it's. I, I it's think, made, I think, open, open well, with well. this one next week. Open with this one and close with uh, Riddle Dunn versus Flash Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews. So I think that would be two bookends uh, next week's NXT perfectly with two awesome matches. And let's be honest, the individuals in the other match I've mentioned aren't any slouches by any stretch of the imagination. I, I completely get your excitement for the Time Splitters versus uh, GYV. I think that's going to be a show stealer. Um, but uh, yeah, it looks like the Dusty. Uh, Dusty Classic has got us talking and has got us really excited, similar to what Brock has done for the War Rumble. I think this year's Dusty Classic could be one of the best. So uh, lots to look forward to next week. And it will be interesting to see uh, how your live stream goes. And whether you've got uh, dual monitors or whether you're flicking between the channels, I can't wait to see that one, Foul. I'm going to be hooked all over that one. But uh, let's have a little chat about this week's AEW then before we move on to NXT UK Blackpool. So the the, the opening match for this one, quite an interesting match, uh, quite a lot of... Uh, psychology and kind of undertones of various things going on here, which we will discuss. But Hangman Adam Page and uh, Kenny Omega, so teaming up 
going up against uh, private parties, really caught a lot of people's interest in AEW um, over the last few months, you could say. Now, going into this match, there's plenty of speculation over whether Adam Page was on board or on the same page as the rest of the elites. Now, we know that he's kind of announced himself as not being part of the elite anymore, but still tea with them, as in this match here, uh, and whether he can still play nicely with his former stablemates. There's obviously been uh, seeds of a possible heel turn from the Hangman over recent weeks on NXT. Uh, Page and Omega share a fist bump before the bell rings, so that's good signs going into this match as they combined quite well in the early part of this match. There's a cool sequence of moves from Mark Quinn, or at least I think it's Mark Quinn, uh, nailing a springboard crossbody dive, sent on somersault planches onto both Hangman and Omega onto the outside, leading to two counts. Uh, Hangman nearly nailed his own partner with a buckshot lariat, with Paige stopping just short of hitting Omega. Uh, Omega, unfortunately, did hit his own partner, but when he flipped one of Private Party into Paige, sending the hangman down to the canvas, However, Omega was able to put the match away with his one-winged angel. Uh, but there's still undertones even at the end. Uh, there's still tension, some tension there between these two, despite the win in this pretty positive opening match. So uh, not just a good match, but a good storyline here, Foul. And you're obviously watching it closely for your live stream. Uh, but to give us your thoughts on this one and kind of where you think the storyline is heading between Hangman Adam Page and the rest of the Elite. Well, I, I, I like I so I've seen a lot on Twitter about people not a hundred percent happy about and I, I kind of understand where they're coming from. Not hundred percent happy with a storyline involving a wrestler who is becoming increasingly more drunk, like you know a storyline based on yeah. a wrestler maybe touching upon issues with alcoholism um, and you know substance abuse. I understand that, but from a from a general point of view. The storyline is that Adam Hangman Page is not happy with his station in life. He has said on many an occasion he's left the elite because he isn't good enough. Like that was the story is that I'm leaving you guys because I don't want to be the only loser on this team. And he said that, you know, explicitly. And so I think that it's nice to have this story where Kenny's like trying to bring up his friend. Like the rest of the elite are like trying to help him out. They're like, come on, man. Like, even though you're losing, don't worry about it. But it was interesting that the match was won by Kenny and not by Paige. And this story has been going on and on and on where I think that maybe it's a revolution. We will see a heel turn from Paige, um, but it will have been earned because it will have taken all this time to get there. The match was great. A great way to kick it off. Um, and we continued on with the story of, you know, um, Pack looking for his match against Kenny. I think that if we see a heel turn from Paige, it may be Paige turning on Kenny with Pack involved in some way. Because obviously they've got that history as well from the matches they had last year. And um, Paige never really came out the winner from those matches either. You know, he 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 would he had his his trouble with Pac. So um, I think that the story is great. And like as a as a general story, I like it, and I like the nuance of what AEW does. Um, but great kickoff to AEW Dynamite this week. Great kickoff. Yeah, I, I, I was going to mention it, and I, I did have it in my show notes about the the theme of Adam Page having a bit of a drinking problem. I mean, he was on commentary last week with a uh, a, a nice uh, drink in his hands, um, and that turned into a meme. Uh, and then this week after the match, he went into the fans and kind of had a few uh, a few brewskis with the audience. And uh, I wondered whether they might kind of kind of build that into the angle of him turning into more of his dark side, which eventually leads him to turn heel. Um, but a very interesting storyline telling, and I think that's... Um, one thing that I'm definitely going to give AEW credit for, certainly in this one, I think they've done a good job here. And, and it's kind of more of a long-term story. They're not bashing it out in a couple of weeks. They're kind of letting it brew and letting, uh, they're taking his fans on a bit of a ride. After the match, we see a clip of uh, Pack attacking Michael Nakazawa backstage. This caused Kenny Omega to run backstage to chase Pack down and to save his friend. Then we get a match uh, for the AEW World uh, Women's World Championship uh, foul. Uh, ch current champion Ryu are going up against Chris Statlander. So partway through this match, we get uh, members of the Nightmare Collective come down to the ring, including Brandy Rhodes, who was on commentary up until things started to break down at ringside. We then see uh, Japanese wrestling deathmatch legend Dr. Luther come from underneath the ring in a rather bizarre kind of debut for him. Uh, he prevented Statlander from striking Brandy, uh, but Ryu got 
she got in on the act by hitting Dr. Luther with a crossbody from off the top uh, turnbuckle to the outside. The match continued, uh, but it was Rihu who got the win after Awesome Kong interfered, leading to a roll-up for the champion uh, and a pinfall win over Chris Statlander. So this was a bit of a strange one, and it's got some negative... Um, negative uh, backlash from people on social media about the way this match ended, that it didn't really show Ryu in any positive light with a, another roll-up win. She's had a couple of roll-up wins and then the introduction of Dr. Luther, the Nightmare Collective, um, Awesome Kong getting involved. Uh, it, was, it was a bit of a a bit of a, a, a negative to this week's AW, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinion, but what about yourself? So, I am... I, um... I know that the like the feeling within like wrestling analysts, commentators, and Modi people was that this week's episode of AE Dynamite was that wasn't that good. Now I, I I, uh, I raised that with a IEW Dynamite this week was a bit meh, like it wasn't mm. terrible, it wasn't amazing, it was just meh, and this was probably one of the real meh moments of the whole show. Um, too much was happening way too much was happening and I think that what's good about AEW and what is really bad about it sometimes is that you bring out someone like Luther now if you're running a company where so if you're running a wrestling show and the commentators don't know who Luther is because he's just turned up like that's fine like because that's how it would legitimately happen you know who's this guy we don't know who he is maybe Excalibur goes oh that's Luther he's from Japan and I know who he is that's fine. But Jim Ross is like, who the hell is this guy? Like, even he says it is like, I don't understand. So commentary becomes confused. Then you can feel Excalibur trying to then explain it and go, well, I, I don't know who he is, but maybe he's a Japanese deathmatch director. Because then he realizes that it's a bit awkward. The crowd have no idea what the hell's going on because there's no way to communicate that to them. So all they end up seeing is like a weird thing happen in the ring. Now, I personally, with the, the Riho stuff, I think that it's been really weird that the way that she's been booked, because the roll-up thing, this week, even this week, she almost seemed angry about winning via roll-up. You know, like, after the roll-up happened, she was a bit like, oh, I don't like the fact that I'm still champion. Like, she even kind of had that feeling. I think that the major reason why people are pissed is because last week we were supposed to see Riho versus Chris Statlander, and it didn't happen. And people were really, really excited for Chris Statlander. So you push us one week, and that's fine. You know, we understood, like, as fans, you understand that she had other things that she was going to be doing. She was going to be at another professional wrestling show. And something that the WWE would have done, which is the WWE would have said, well, she's not going to any of the shows now. She signed with us. It was not nice to say, well, the bigger company don't want to screw over the smaller company who have booked them. And so let her go and make her dates. But then having that match this week and then having it end in such a fluff, like such a weird thing as well. Like I liked the fact that, you know, this set up a match for next week at Bash at the Peach, which seems quite an interesting match at Bash. But it just ended really strangely. Like I actually would have probably preferred if this match had ended in our DQ instead of ending in an actual finish. Um but one thing I have to take away from this match is that Brandy Rhodes calling Excalibur Exhibit was my highlight of the night. Like, she was, like, she was good what? on commentary. I thought she was very fun on commentary. I thought that she was great on commentary. It was like, Exhibit, why do you wear a mask? My name's not Exhibit. That's fine, Exhibit. And I was like, oh, this is... That's, <laughs> I think that's another thing. Like, it's There was so much happening that the match in the ring kind of became like window dressing for the segment that was happening around it. And... I think that's what people got pissed about is that, you know, women's wrestling in the WWE is always treated as an afterthought. And in AEW, it should not be an afterthought. And the fact that the women's champion is there having a championship match and all of this other stuff is happening around it. She still retains, but she's not a heel after dusty shenanigans. I almost feel like Riho needs to turn heel now, like because that's the feel. That we're getting from her but i didn't think that anyone would ever would turn her heel so it's just it was a very strange segment and a very strange match that i was quite excited for to begin with yeah and unfortunately with all the outside interference and the roll-up finish the aw women's championship just doesn't feel 
as special as it should. It's, it does still feel special. We know that they've got a developing roster. We know that it's quite a thin roster, but with what they have, they're doing quite well. I think it's got a lot of potential, uh, far outweighing what it's been able to present to us so far. Um, what they're doing with Britt Baker, I do not know. She was meant to be kind of like the, the figurehead, one of the spokeswomen of the women's division. She's been treated probably worse than if she'd been gone on to anywhere else. Um, yeah. But, you know, the booking of some of these individuals, um, it does leave a lot to be desired. But uh, I was not a fan of this segment. I don't think many people were. Um, let, let's move on to another bit then. So then we saw Sammy Guevara. Uh, he defeated Christopher Daniels in a match. But after the match, we saw the Dark Order. They came down to offer Christopher Daniels a place in the Dark Order. Daniels turns their offer down, uh, leading to a beatdown of Daniels from the members of the Dark Order. They said two are running from Scorpio Sky and Kazarian uh, and the Young Bucks to make the save and to uh, somewhat redeem themselves after that embarrassing beatdown from the Dark order they received in the pre-Christmas episode of Dynamite. So a question for you, Fowley, are you a fan of the Dark Order? Uh, what's your opinion on the storyline here and what they're building towards um, and what they've done with the Dark Order so far? So Dark Order has been, I think this is what I was talking about, how like the crowd sometimes can't always connect with what the viewer is seeing. Um, like when the Dark Order first came in, I was like, okay, this, this seems interesting intriguing i don't really get it but i've got time to i was in my mind i was always like okay we don't get the explanation on dynamite we're gonna get it in being the elite we're gonna get it on dark we're gonna get it somewhere else that's fine i watch all that stuff anyway so to me it's fine but the crowd when they first turned up didn't weren't very responsive uh obviously what happened before christmas in that final show with the punch that didn't help them whatsoever um i'm really down for the dark order i think that they bring something different i think that they bring that kind of feeling that you know like with all the video packages were how they should have been introduced to begin with in my opinion is those video packages the whole join dark order um the whole like feeling of you know you're a loser and you want to get better that's like wrestling 101 yeah. that's like you know that playing mm. yeah playing to people's emotions saying like you know this is the kind of feeling that you'd have from a like they remind me of um serotonin from tna um where um raven's little like uh, group that he had we had kazarian and he had uh what's his name matt something uh matt bentley matt bentley and a few others and he had this group and basically they were losers they were jobbers and every time they lost a match they'd have to get beaten with these like kendo sticks um and it happened on tna and that's kind of had the feel it had for me now the one thing i can say is that the story with cd with christopher daniels where he's been losing every single week it now feel again it feels earned you know, like every single week, like he even, and I don't know if you watch Being the Elite, like before Christmas, he botched serving um, hot chocolate to everyone at the, the book's house. So like he's like, I made this hot chocolate, I love this hot chocolate, it's so good, I weigh it all year. And then he falls over and slips and he spills it all. And so this has been going on for ages where Christopher Daniels has not been able to ever win. Having the Dark Order come out and actually ask him to join, I thought that that was it. I thought that that was perfect. But again, I think that it's taking time for them to really get over with the crowd. But everything that the Dark Order do on the internet is great. Like, I saw the unlisted video they put up where they have the exalted one and stuff. And I put a comment in, something like, uh, and I put a comment, and they replied to me. And I remember thinking, oh my God, the Dark Order know who I am. <laughs> like, but, uh, they're trying to recruit you, that's why. <laughs> oh, they know, I'm a they know I'm a loser. They know I'm a loser, that's what I win. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I think that they really, truly are getting them. I think that that video package, if you watch that, it's it's going to take time. They're feeling, they're feeling it out. I think that's what's really good about Dynamite is that they can, like, they have a story. They, they have point A and they have point B, yeah, and they want to get to point B. They leave enough space and room for themselves to maybe zip off to other places to get to that point B, or maybe along the way point B shifts a little bit. But it's not like the WWE where something happens one week and just doesn't work. So everything changes next week significantly. And there's no remnant of what happened last week because mm. 
everyone forgets about it. It's been seven days. Like they play into that. So the Dark Order has been uh has been intriguing. It's been intriguing, but I'm definitely definitely down to see what they've got to do with Christopher Daniels. I mean, of all the people as well to recruit into your group to wear a mask and play someone else. Christopher Daniels is probably the best one out there. So, like, I loved Curry Man. I loved Curry Man. So, if he comes in as anyone else, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? He's notorious for wearing masks in his history before. And I think it would be quite interesting to have Christopher Daniels have his Dark Order with a mask version and his um, SCU version, like, you know, the two of them, and have them conflict and have them as two different versions of it. I think that would be quite interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what plays out over the next few weeks. Our next match to discuss was uh, Brothers Cody and Dustin Rhodes versus uh, another team of brothers, the Lucha Brothers, of course, uh, Ray Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. So, as always, the Lucha Brothers were their usual high-flying, innovative sales. Ray Phoenix delivered uh, an impressive tightrope walk kick to Cody Rhodes, but it was Dustin who put the match away with a beautiful Canadian destroyer, followed by a final reckoning for the pinfall victory. It was a clean victory for Cody and Dustin over arguably the best tag team in the world right now. Certainly, they are voted the best team in 2019. They are Wrestling with John's end of year awards. Uh, but uh, is it right uh, for Penta and for Ray Phoenix to be fed to Cody and Dustin on an episode of Dynamite, in your opinion? I mean, you know, the match was promoted heavily in the seven days leading up to Dynamite this Wednesday uh, to, to bring eyeballs to their product, of course, and to help boost the ratings. Uh, but then the Lucha Brothers kind of lost on one of their weekly TV shows where maybe, you know, a, a, a team, the calibre of the Lucha Brothers should really only be losing on pay-per-view, if at all. But uh, that's kind of the one question I have coming out of this match is, you know, Dustin and Cody, they're a very credible force individually and collectively. But to uh, to go over against the Lucha Brothers on a weekly uh, episode of Dynamite, what were your thoughts on this one, Fel? Um yeah like the lucha brothers um they it's like it's really hard to say that like cuz we talk about dynamite like it's raw like i think that the difference with something like dynamite is that that is their only show like that is the true show so it's not like they're losing on an episode of dynamite it's like they're losing on the weekly pay-per-view like i look at it like that so it's still a big deal for them to lose. And, I mean, can I just say that Dustin Rhodes does a very sweet Canadian Destroyer, almost as good as Ricky Morton's. He the really NWA. does, yeah. It is pretty it's... sweet. And he, he looks as good as ever, to be honest with you. Yeah, like, so having him win, I don't think is, a, is like a drop for the, um, for the Lucha Brothers. I think that with the Lucha Brothers is that they have won so much in 2019 that I'm seeing this shift now where they're starting to lose a bit to make them more believable in being beaten by other teams. Because you're right, they're probably the best tag team in the world, um, bar none. And I'd definitely say that. But having them in these matches where they actually have to tag in, have to tag out, something which was spoken about where they had that conversation with Chris, Chris Jericho, and he told them, you need to start tagging. Yeah, you need to stop just doing high spots. I think this was great. To have that kind of match where it felt like an old school wrestling, you know, tag team match. I think it's nice to have the Lucha Brothers lose because it makes their wins so much more impressive then. You're, you're balancing them out. But it is, um, I think that with Cody not going for the AEW championship and that maybe be taken away from him for a bit. I think that there is nothing wrong with the greatest team on your roster losing every now and then or the greatest wrestler on your roster losing every now and then because it makes it more believable when someone then beats them in the future because otherwise like if it's that one time beat down i mean like let's say jericho you don't want to beat jericho all year long because he is your champion but with something like jungle boy where he outlasts him in time that's fine and I, I, I love the match. I loved this match, this tag team match. It was and a good match. I, yeah. yeah, and I think that's the thing is that we're looking at it like the wins and losses. I think that obviously wins and losses matter in AEW. So you have to have that team lose every now and then. Otherwise, you've got the Lucha Brothers that who will be um, number one contenders year in, year out. 
there's no way that they're going to lose. So you've got to give them a few losses every now and then. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I think my, my biggest uh, kind of point with this is you've got an established team with Ray Phoenix and Pentagon going up against, yeah, their brothers, fair enough, but they're not an established team of Cody and Dustin. And uh, we'll have to see, you know, what journey this takes uh, the Lucha Brothers on, whether they continue to lose, whether it's just a blip. Um, but uh, nevertheless, match quality, I thought it was fantastic. And I thought Dustin Rose looked fantastic in the ring, looked but, very fluid and, and some of the moves he pulled off um, w- was excellent for a, a man of his experience, shall we say. Yeah, plus, I was going to say that the other thing we always forget about is that these two tag teams are amazing singles performers on oh, their own. Totally. So, yeah. so, you know, you could have the Lucha Brothers as a tag team lose the whole year and or like part of the year and you say, you know what, I don't want a team anymore. Can we go off on our own ways? And they can look at each other. And that's believable. Like, that's a believable split where you could say, all right, we're not tagging this year in AEW. We're going to go for the gold. We're going to have that match. And having the Lucha Brothers go up against each other, like here in AEW, one-on-one action, like, I think that that's going to put a lot of butts in seats. Like, I truly think it would. Like, so, but yeah, no, I totally take your point as well. Yeah, and then we had a, a fun six-man tag match uh, featuring the Jurassic Express going up against the best friends in Orange Cassidy. Cassidy. So a funny story here. So my wife, she's not a wrestling fan at all. She came home from work just as this match was on the TV, just as this match was starting. Now, uh, I, I like the Jurassic Express. I, I like Luchasaurus. I think he's got a very bright future. He's got a great look, a great gimmick. Uh, but when you have a man playing a dinosaur on your screen in the wrestling ring, then you have Marco Stunts, who looks smaller than you know many many teenagers to be honest with you and then orange cassidy in the ring it's just not the best match to have on the tv in front of a non-wrestling fan and uh they're just going to kind of look at the tv look at you and then walk out the room uh just put yourself in my position here foul it it was it was an embarrassing two minutes now now the individuals we know that they're all very capable wrestlers. We understand their gimmick. We understand the comedy behind it. We understand the personalities. To a non-wrestling fan, it's going to be one of them eye-rolling moments and straight out the door. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 that um, it's that moment, isn't it, when like you you've you've taken loads of time like to get someone to watch professional wrestling with you, and you're like, and this <laughs> point when they're like, you know what, I will, I'll sit down with you, I'll sit and watch this show, and then you put it on, and you're like. I'm really sorry. It's not like this every week. I'm really, really <laughs> sorry. And it's like, well, this is what we watch all the time. Uh, it really is. Uh, but, but, but yeah, but it's definitely, if you were channel surfing, you'd probably stop and watch for like a minute or so, wouldn't you? Just to see what's happening. Oh, just with the personalities in the ring. It's pure entertainment. It really <laughs> was. The th- things started to pick up once Luchasaurus got the hot tag. Uh, the crowd went wild once Orange Cassidy got the hot tag for his team. Nailing Luchasaurus with a stunner before hitting uh, a dive through the ropes. Hands firmly tucked in pockets as always. Marco uh, spikes Trent with a destroyer before being thrown into the heel group from the outside by his own partner, Luchasaurus. The match came to an end when Jungle Boy was able to reverse an attempted powerbomb from Chuck Taylor into a Hurricane Rana roller pin for a win for his team, the Jurassic Express. So this was a fun match. Uh, like I, said, I love the individuals. But where do you stand on Orange Cassidy? I think that every group out there, whether it be on Twitter, on Facebook, there's always the conversation, Orange Cassidy, is he legit or is he not? Uh, but where do you stand on Orange Cassidy? Are you a fan? Yeah, like, I mean, how can you not be? Like, he's... <laughs> he's getting over big time. <laughs> he is, isn't he? Like, you know, someone someone said on Twitter, like, when he ends up winning the big one, yeah? Like, when he ends up winning a championship, the, cl- the place is going to go, like, nuts. Like, there's, there's no way, like, you know, you're going to see people, like, you know, it, like, the celebration will be so big. <laughs> I, I, I think that with Orange Cassidy, <laughs> it's because... Because he's so like, you watch him and you think it's so different. Like it's, it's the, it is the thing that all professional wrestling like fans hate. Like, in a way, yeah, it's like you make you're killing the business. Like no one would ever do that. He doesn't care. Like <laughs> if you literally look at that from an old school wrestling mind, yeah. You, you imagine watch Jim, that, Jim Cornette, like, Jim Cornette watching a, an Orange Cassidy matches. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine that would be uh, entertaining in itself? <laughs> I'd love to, I would love to see that, yeah, because, like, in a way, yeah, in my mind, I, I have this feeling that Jim Cornette would be watching it and going, I like what he's doing. 
<laughs> I like what he's doing. Oh, I, I, but I can't tell anyone I like what he's doing. And, and that's it. He's different. Like, imagine, like, someone like Orange Cassidy, and you look at it from, like, length of, like, career. He's not going out there and doing, like, ridiculous spots where he lands on his neck all the time. He's not going out there and, like, doing things that are going to hurt him and taking massive bumps. Like, the biggest thing that he does within AEW is his Topis Suicida with his hands through his, in his pocket. But other than that, that guy's career could go on forever and ever and ever because he's just... He's just got that about him, and I like him. I, I, every the first time I saw him truly was in um, when he was in that match, uh, the, the 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 battle royal, and he started like kicking up against um, uh, Tommy Dreamer, and everyone was like going crazy, and I was like. I don't understand what is this is gimmick that like he does little kicks and stuff like and then I saw it later on and I was like oh I like this I like this a lot and one thing I have to say is when he met Chris Statlander backstage I think it was on AEW um, I think it was on Being the Elite and she was like drinking coffee out of like a like a bowl or something out of the coffee machine and then uh, the best friends come over to her and say are you an alien and she's like yeah and she says. <laughs> take me to your leader and then orange cassidy turns up and saying nothing she looks at him and just walks off and i was like that's it he's an alien he's an alien like i didn't realize that that's what the whole gimmick is he's mork from orc that's what he is <laughs> like, he's a uh... yeah I, I love him i love him yeah. like, we need to have a little bit of fun in our wrestling every now and then you know like in, that's what he is that's what he yeah, is. Yeah, it can't be, can't be kind of five star classics from the Tokyo Dome all the time, can it? It's, it's got to be. I mean, wrestling is all about entertainment. Wrestling is all about kind of comedy and being entertained. You, you, there's got to be, uh, you know, like a, like a good meal. There's got to be so many different elements added to it. And so I think Orange Cassidy is that element that we never knew we wanted all this time. Um, and I must admit, I, I started off thinking, oh, no, it's not for me. And I'm more the traditional wrestling fan. And where's the wrestling? Uh, but the more I see of him, it's like, yeah, I'm getting into him. The fans dig in big time, foul. And um, mm-hmm. let's say one day, could he win a championship? Uh, because when shit goes down, he can put off some wrestling moves. It's not just the dives through the ropes with the hands in the pockets. He, he you know, if you look back at his uh, former career before Orange Cassidy, he's a, he's a pretty capable wrestler and he does pull out some pretty, uh, more of a fast paced, uh, fast paced action shall we say when he needs to but uh, yeah I'm, I'm coming round to Orange Cassidy slowly but surely but um, there were some big matches announced for next week's AEW Dynamite that I want to touch on before our kind of main main event segment Chris Statlander and uh, Shida going up against Awesome Kong and Mel. Now, I'm not too familiar with Mel, but I'm sure we get to see more of her next week. Pack versus Darby Allen. Now that's one match that's definitely got my interest I think these two kind of Quite uh, unique uh, wrestlers have got uh, more of a hybrid style. Um, I think those two are going to tear the roof down, tear the place down next week. DDP in his first wrestling match in however many years. Uh, I think he's into his 60s, but all that DDPY is keeping him young at heart and young in the body. He's, he's teaming up with uh, uh, Dustin Rhodes and QT Marshall to go up against MJF, The Butcher and The Blade. Uh, and then uh, John Moxley taking on Sammy Guevara. Now, I think there was another match that was announced earlier on. I've got a picture of it here just to remind me, but it's uh, uh, it the Young Bucks. Team. Yeah, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega and Hangman Adam Page going up against... Uh, going up against uh, Santana and Ortiz uh, and um, is it uh, best friends as well? So is it uh, an eight-man tag? I think it's yeah. an eight-man tag looking at the picture. Yeah, it's and an eight-man eight tag. Eight-man yeah. tag fate um, yeah. Which actually, again, continuing the storyline with what's going on with Paige, if you look on Paige's Twitter, when he's um, tweeted it out, he says, looks like they created a brand new background just for me. And then when you watch it, you can see that, like, he's really far back in the photo. Like, they've even, like, the storyline even continues with the screenshots of the matches. Like, it's amazing. Yeah, so you are right. It is it is a four team match. Um, so so that will be quite intriguing, and I think I think that's where we can see a little bit more of a development within the storyline there with Adam Page and Kenny Omega in the box as well. Uh, but uh, that we could that could be worth watching for a potential heel turn or maybe uh, more fuel added to the fire in that one. But then we get our main event segment. Then fuel uh, fell. With uh, Jericho and his inner circle stable mate Sammy Guevara, uh, big hurt. Um, they they uh, they're two 
uh, they're present as we get the entrance of John Moxley, of course, who will be uh, giving Jericho his answer on whether uh, he will or will not join the group. Uh, Jericho asks again if John Moxley will join the inner circle. Moxley, Moxley said that uh, you might think that you, you know what makes him tick, what motivates what motivates him, if I can get my words out, uh, but you don't. Uh, Mox says that uh, he can't be brought he came to AEW to run rough shot and to dominate, and that uh, that is why his answer is yes. So a little bit of a swerve there. He kept his guessing until the very last second. Mox opens up his jacket to reveal his inner circle T-shirt that he was presented with a few weeks ago from Jericho. Uh, Mox reaffirms uh, that he came to dominate, and uh, there are no more powerful force than in AEW than the inner circle. He calls Chris Jericho one of the greatest of all time, and he wants to surround himself with greatness. Uh, the group starts to celebrate with a little bit of a bubbly. Uh, Jericho says that uh, this is the beginning of the inner circle taking over AEW. Uh, Jericho gave Mox the key to the 750,000 car that he promised him and just when you thought moxley was now an official member of the inner circle moxley stopped jericho by saying hey chris he was just kidding and there's no way that he was going to be part of his stupid little group before smashing a bottle of the bubbly over jericho's head and leaving uh, through the fans while jake hager comforted uh, Le Champion Chris Jericho who was knocked out on the uh, on the, the ring floor of course uh, this was a really fun segment I thought that everybody played their part really really well in this and this now sets up a championship match between Moxley and current champion uh, Jericho perfectly for the 29th of February uh, showdown at their next pay-per-view and I'm, I'm also glad that they didn't drag this part of the storyline out any longer than was necessary I thought to kind of do the reveal um, all in one night um, I thought it was perfectly played out and an excellent segment uh, for Mox to briefly join the group before turning his back on Jericho uh, was the most sensible thing to do in my opinion mainly because it didn't you know, suit Moxley's character to be part of the inner circle for any longer than was necessary um, but um, he's always been a bit of a lone wolf and uh, he remains the lone wolf and uh, John Moxley no longer part of the inner circle it's very very brief but he's got a nice shiny £750,000 car to drive off in uh, but uh, what were your thoughts in this main event segment to this week's Dynamite buddy? So so you really liked it I didn't Ooh, yeah I, okay. uh, I know, and I'm really sorry, but what I say, I, I agree with your point where you say that you didn't want this dragged out any further. I agree with that, yeah. I think, though, in this segment, they dragged it out too long. Mm. Like, there was, and I think that it comes back to that whole thing that I talked about where the crowd don't always know how to react, yeah. So, like, like Moxie comes out and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, I'm happy, yeah, yeah, like, I'm going to join you, yeah, yeah, yeah. He shows a t shirt. And everyone in the crowd is a bit like, I, 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 do, 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 do I cheer this now? <laughs> like, do, do, you could just see it. And I was watching it. And I even put a tweet out straight away saying, he said yes. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they're like celebrating. And it felt like weird. Like, again, it just felt really strange. Like, and we were all waiting for the swerve. Like, it's like everyone was just waiting for the swerve. So no one wanted to do anything. And then it lasted, it felt like, 20 minutes yeah it was only like a minute or so felt like 20 minutes of them like here's here's a prop you know they felt like they were they were just going around with their bubbly like holding up their glasses and holding up the bottle and they're all like congratulating each other and everyone left and it felt like the end and that's when that's when moxie went wait a second chris 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 chris, chris. I, was, I was i was kidding like it didn't feel right like you know what should have really happened there really truly should have happened there cool. should have ended the show they should have ended the show the second that he joined should have ended the show that should have been it. Yeah. We should have had to wait till next week. Yeah, it would have dragged out another week. We should have had to wait till next week. We should have had to wait till Jericho had pulled out like the Festival of Friendship next week at the beginning of the show. And, you know, where's Moxley? Where's Moxley? Oh, he'll be here soon. Where's Moxley? And then this is what you do. Yeah. This is what I would have done. You've got Moxley with his, the $750,000 car. You've got him outside of the arena. And he's trashing the crap out of that car as they're in the ring going, oh, no, no. I know that it's like a really cliched thing to do, yeah? But that's how you do it. And that's how you then set up for revolution. Because what's going to happen now is obviously next week we're going to have that segment of, I can't believe he didn't want to do the thing. And da, 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 da. 
but it would have felt so much better next week because you would have had a whole week of is Moxley a heel now? Like, is he? Like, you could have had that speculation go on for the week. Instead, now it's like, it's weird. Or I expected Moxley to say, hey, Jericho, you know, so I joined a lad and then just drip <laughs> appeared. Because again, yeah, like, and so to me, that last segment didn't feel right. Uh, it just didn't. There's just something about it. And that's what led me to my whole meh feeling on the show. Like, it was good. And I think that I, I think that as AEW fans, sometimes we, um, <laughs> we, we, we give a little too much credit to the company and we let them off certain things. This was one of those situations when I was like, nah, nah. Like, I, I don't know what it is. It just felt too long. And the second that they were all celebrating, I was waiting to see the AEW logo. I was waiting to see it. You know what would have been even more interesting would have been to like pull an NXT job on it, put the logo in the bottom, and like done all the business, and then go like, oh my god, he's joined the he's joined the inner circle. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Don't, don't, don't. And then the, the logo fades out, and then he pulls like a Tommaso Ciampa and goes, whoa, whoa, actually, I lied. And then that would have been even more. That would have been a nod to the other company. That would have been fantastic. Instead, it went to that weird kind of almost like they were waiting for a reaction in the ring. And someone said to me on Heel Pops and Chair Shots, maybe they called an audible in the ring. Maybe they went, oh, the, the crowd don't like this. You know what? Let's just pull this trigger right now. But then what was said to me and what makes sense is that, the you know, obviously he hits him with one champagne bottle, which I've got behind me, and smashes him in the head with it. The second one, as he was running away, dropped to the ground and just fell apart. So there were several sugar, you know, there were several like sugar yeah. bottles hit sugar glass bottles so that was definitely set up in advance that was not an on the fly thing um but yeah i didn't yeah. i like the fact that i just didn't I, just something about it it's like i didn't it hate didn't it click it didn't didn't quite click for you I, yeah yeah but um yeah. It, 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 was, it was a fun segment i enjoyed i enjoyed it um i think more than anything i i didn't really want to see moxley as part of the inner circle i don't think it would fit his character so when they kind of transitioned from the big reveal to the the, the turn uh that kind of you know was good as far as I was concerned, because that was the outcome that I was after. Yes, they probably could have dragged it off another week, let you know, people talk amongst themselves on Twitter saying, well, Monks has joined the inner circle, how's it going to play out? Why did he do that? Could he really, have, you know, and then did the reveal, I was, I was lying, you know, I don't want to be part of your stupid group a couple of weeks down the line, but it would be interesting to see what they've got in store for as fans to help build this storyline because revolution isn't for another month and a half so they've got another five or six weeks of dynamite to build this story and get us more intrigued um and i think the story that they're leading into because of course one of the matches on next week's episode is sammy Guevara versus john moxley is possibly john moxley going through every member of the inner circle uh, until he has to get to the big boss chris jericho on february the 29th and that's possibly what they're going to be doing so be be interesting to see I, i'm interested in what they're doing um but um i mean do you think they're going down that path of uh, moxley potentially facing each member of the inner circle until he gets to the big boss i think that you're absolutely right and i think that's why it went down the way it went which is why i don't this is why like in the grand scheme of things i understand why that was done but in the moment of me watching a professional wrestling show i didn't like it but that's what AEW does differently to the WWE product. When you watch stuff later on, in context, it's perfect. In the second, sometimes it just doesn't feel right. But I think that that makes a lot of sense. And that's exactly why Jericho surrounded himself with this group of, you know, like lower tier people to go, not lower tier, but, you know, like his his bodyguards, his group, his friends to then look after him. It's the paranoid champion kind of, uh, you know, trope, isn't it? Where you've got a champion who surrounds himself or herself with people to defend her until you get to her. And even then by that point, like you've built up a baby face significantly because they've had to go through heel after heel after heel after heel after heel. And they've had to probably go through situations where other people would have lost. And I think that it does work great for moxie's character and that's what i agree with you about definitely i didn't want to see him join the inner circle but i wanted him to join it because i knew that he was never going to really be part of it mm. and what would have been nice was for him to 
maybe make a mention of like I don't want to be your shield, Jericho. And I think that's, you know, there's certain things that could have happened over that week. Like, I don't feel like we're equals. Like, because when I used to be part of a group, we were all equal. You know, there's so much to say there, which maybe we will see next week. And maybe that's why it happened the way it did. Um, But we've got a lot of time coming up to Revolution. Um, In between, of course, in the in the outside wrestling world, we've got um, John Moxley going up against Suzuki, uh, Minoru Suzuki um, in New Japan, happening in February and not too long beforehand. Will we see Jericho in the Inner Circle turn up? Because that's something that I thought might have happened at Wrestle Kingdom. But now that this story, that he's pissed off the Inner Circle beforehand, and that's only a few weeks ago, well, a few a weeks away even, will we see Jericho turn up in New Japan? At, uh, at any of those events and maybe get involved will he cost john moxley the u.s championship against suzuki which will cause even further strife in the inner circle further strife over an aew dynamite and it will also maybe make that relationship <laughs> happen maybe it will happen oh you, you, you're getting the, the, the creative juices flowing there and uh potential cross promotion stuff and uh we, we thought we you know we might see uh Something develop over Wrestle Kingdom. Of course, we had Moxley and and uh, Jericho on uh, Wrestle Kingdom, and that was a hell of a show both nights. But um, yes, we will have to see. And I'm for one, I'm looking forward to Moxley versus Suzuki. I think that's going to be an absolute show stealer, barn burner. Call it what you will, but that's going to be an amazing match between two guys that kind of beat the lumps out of one another. But um, AEW was a good show. NXT was a good show. One show that I'm sure will be amazing is a show that I'm going to be at tomorrow night in uh, Blackpool, England, uh, the, the home of where NXT UK started, you could say, almost what three years to the day when we had the uh, the tournament to crown the first ever United Kingdom champion. Um, and that, that was uh, won by Tyler Bate, of course, beating Pete Dunne in the final. Uh, we've only had a couple of champions since then. It went from Tyler Bate to Pete Dunne to Walter. Uh, of course, we had the first ever NXT UK takeover in Blackpool last year, almost uh, 12 months to the day. Um, where uh, uh, Pete Dunne retained his championship over Joe Coffey. And, of course, we had the the introduction, the debut, the first sighting on an NXT ring of Walter, where he kicked Joe Coffey out of the ring at the end of that match to have that stare down with Pete Dunne. And then we had the takeover Cardiff, which I was also at, that incredible 44-minute match between Walter and Tyler Bate. And then we get the next uh, NXT UK takeover um, in Blackpool, Blackpool 2, and uh, some really, really amazing matches. There's been some good builds to all five of these matches. There's a few in particular that I'm really excited for, uh, but I'm really interested to get uh, Fowl's opinion on some of these. So let's start with one or two of the matches then uh, for NXT UK takeover Blackpool 2 taking place tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow afternoon in the UK, 5pm it kicks off. That's probably going to be noon Eastern over in the States. Um, But uh, the the first batch I'm particularly intrigued by, Trent Seven versus Eddie Dennis. So we've not seen an awful lot of Eddie Dennis in an NXT UK take, NXT ring uh, over recent months. He's just recovered from uh, quite a serious uh, shoulder injury, I believe, uh, having had surgery. But he has since uh, become the Progress World Champion. Uh, I don't think that's been acknowledged on NXT TV yet. Um, But between these two very experienced, very capable, very exciting wrestlers um, that no each other very well and uh, I think this is going to be a good match good psychological match but uh, what about this one Trent Seven versus Eddie Dennis then so um big fan of Trent Seven obviously Mustache Mountain um I'm, I've always been a big fan of those guys um what's quite interesting is that of course a lot of the people on the NXT UK roster are from the Midlands um so Eddie Dennis I believe is from the Midlands as well um and I, I think he's from South Wales, but uh... South Wales. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No nope. correction. That's right. Um, I think that with Trent Seven facing off against Eddie Dennis, um, I know that Eddie Dennis won the Progress Championship not that long ago. Um, mm. Is it the which one is it? I think it's the the newer one. Is it the Proteus Championship? Well, it's actually their their uh, their world champion, but uh, their unified well, world champion because of course the Atlas title which which was once held by Trent Seven got merged with their heavyweight championship. So it's now the Progress Unified Champion. So he, he carries two belts at the moment under the Progress banner. Yeah. That's it. So it's, the, it's, the, it's the Atlas one because I knew that Trent Seven had won a championship, a Correct. very similar one that he's holding at the moment. Yes. So I, th- I think that this match 
is is going to be a really interesting one because I think that Eddie Dennis kind of coming back after an injury and going up against Trent Seven, who always puts on a great display. Um, I think they're going to get to see something quite special um, between them two. And especially at these NXT UK takeovers, I think that the crowd really, really will acknowledge that they're both great guys and they're both great wrestlers. I think that winning wise, we're probably going to see Eddie Dennis come out the winner because of the connection that the U, uh, that the WWE have with progress anyway. Mm. Um, and I think that possibly, no, I don't know for sure, but in 2020, especially if the network wants to start showing other promotions on a regular basis, um, maybe we'll see Eddie Dennis come out the winner to help to facilitate that and to have like progress on the network a little bit more. Uh, so I think we're going to get to see a lot more said about this match than we thought we would. Um, but I think we're going to come out with a winning winner of Eddie Dennis. Yeah, and I'm inclined to agree with you as well, mainly because he's uh, returning from an injury, so he's fairly fresh um, to a lot of people that may have not been watching NXT UK for the last uh, four or five, six months. Um, but uh, I think because he, he's returned, usually the, the return in wrestling normally gets to kind of win in these sort of matches. But I'm a big fan of both wrestlers. I think they're definitely going to deliver in the ring. It's not going to be one of them kind of flips and dives sort of matches. It's going to be much more kind of ground-based and much more psychological. Uh, but uh, definitely looking forward to that one. But I'm I'm kind of pitting uh, uh, Eddie Dennis to uh, to get the win there. Um, how about one match that probably will be some flips and dives as well as some power moves and one match that I'm definitely looking forward to. Uh, Tyler Bate, the former UK champion, going up against uh, Jordan Devlin. Now, these two similar stature, similar style wrestlers, um, much more kind of stockier and more powerful, um, but can definitely deliver in the ring um, in kind of many styles of wrestling. But uh, I'm a big fan of these two. Uh, but uh, Tyler Bate versus Jordan Devlin. Um, I personally would like to see Jordan Devlin get the win. I don't think he's really had a fair shake of things on NXT UK recently. Of course, he had that amazing match against Finn Balor at uh, TakeOver Blackpool 1 uh, 12 months ago, January 2019. And now Tyler Bate is one of my favourite wrestlers, uh, mainly because of, of, of what he's been able to achieve um, at such a young age and his ability in the ring just far surpass, uh, so it surpasses anybody of his age. I think he's only 23, maybe 24. Uh, but yeah. I remember seeing a match of his uh, back in 2014 when he would have been, what, a teenager, 16, 17. But uh, give us your thoughts on this one. I'm, I'm kind of going for a Jordan Devlin win here, but uh, it's going to be a, a, a real good match. I, I think that Jordan Devlin picking up the win is the smart choice here mm. anyway. Because what I was going to say about Trent Seven going up against Eddie Dennis is Trent Seven doesn't get hurt by a loss in that match no. at all. And it's the same with Tyler Bate. He doesn't get hurt by a loss in this match at all. Jordan Devlin does, though. And I think that because of... The perception of, say, Tyler Bate and the perception of, say, Jordan Devlin. Jordan Devlin hasn't, in my opinion, picked up the big win yet. And you're talking about the match that he had last year at Blackpool. That was, I think, the most high-profile match he has had in 2019. And it didn't matter if he won or lost in that match. That didn't matter. But because of his stat like his stature and his stock and the fact that that match was that student versus teacher kind of match. Um, I think that he needs to pick up the win here. I, I respect both men massively. And again, Tyler Bate is a, uh, is a Midlands boy. And I am, um, yeah, and I, I love him. I, I love him. I, I think that his gimmick is great. Um, I think that again, like for someone of that size to have the power that he has as well, to be that big, strong boy, yeah. it's insane. Like <laughs> I, I, I talk about uh, when, when I went to NXT UK last year in 2019, um, we saw here in Birmingham, there was, uh, they came over, did some tapings. Uh, so I went to the second night of tapings with um, a massive wrestling fan massive wrestling fan and i went with a, a kind of he, he knows wrestlers a little bit and we both went there and like me and the massive wrestling fan like we're going crazy or like everything tyler bait comes out for the next two weeks yeah this non-wrestling fan anytime anything happened yeah you know we went into somewhere and someone opened the door and it was a little stuck or you opened a bottle and it was a little tight the second you got it open big strong boy big strong boy big strong boy <laughs> uh, and i was like and even in the crowd we were in the crowd like he didn't really get down with many of the chants but that one he was down with he saw he saw tyler bait and he was like that guy 
and you know we went back and started watching stuff on the network and he was really into that um so i really think jordan Devlin needs to win uh even though i think both men are amazing i think we are going to get to see some very 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 great technical special like flippy stuff but in a very very ex- a very very uh logical fashion yeah um, they're, they're uh, not one trick they're, they're not one trick ponies they, they can mix it up in various forms I, I think as you were saying earlier on with like pack versus alan these are two hybrid wrestlers as well and i think we're going to mm. get to see that kind of style where it's not just power it's not just flips it's not just mm. technical stuff it's everything yeah, totally agree. Um, how about the, the, the fatal four-way tag team ladder match for the NXT UK Tag Team Champions? So this match, well, uh, uh, talk about show stealers again. Um, you know, you had you had ladders in 20 match and you, you're going to get um, a, a dramatic happening. Uh, but then to add current tag team champions, Mark Coffey and Wolfgang Gallus, we spoke earlier about them in the Dusty Classic. To get Imperium, uh, Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel, we spoke about them earlier. They're in the Dusty Classic. The Grizzled Young Veterans, former champions, and uh, former champions again, um, Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews. This is a bit of a dream match, but you know that this is going to be, wow, you're going to see some pretty amazing stuff off them ladders. Um, hopefully no injuries. But these guys are going to take some bumps on Sunday night. And uh, yeah, this is going to be one of them matches where I can see holy shit chance uh, being announced every few seconds because of the punishment these guys are going to put themselves through. Um, I don't know who to pick on this one. It really is one of them. It's, it's, it's a pick. Um, I'd love to see yeah. Imperium win purely because they've not been tag team champions on any of the NXT brands so far, uh, whereas the other three teams have. I wouldn't mind seeing the Grizzled Young Veterans re- re- regain or retain their championships because they were fantastic champions the first time round and involved in some tremendous tag team matches. And I do think that they're probably the best tag team in the UK, Europe and possibly the world at the moment because they do gel together so well that their, their, their combo moves are better than I've seen from many tag teams in the last few years. Gallus, yep, yeah, I like them, like what they can do. Big fan of uh, Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster. But uh, yeah, Imperium for me, only because they haven't won the gold yet. And I think they've got uh, a few things to prove to the fans tomorrow night in Blackpool. But uh, who's your uh, your favourite out of these four teams, NFL? So my favourite team is your favourite team, which is GYV, mm. Grizzly Young Vets. I love them. I love them. They're, they're every, they are everything that professional wrestling should be. Like, you know, there's sometimes you say a team... They know how to get under your skin. I, fir- I first I first discovered Zach Gibson on Five Star Wrestling. <laughs> like I was watching Five Star Wrestling, which uh, was a TV show which came on over here on Free Sports. It lasted for five weeks. It was um, we had many names on there. Jake Hager was their champion, um, and I saw this guy called Zach Gibson. I had no idea who he was. Didn't know who he was whatsoever. And he stole the show every week, came out there and it was just like just just gold every time. And James Drake, uh, when I saw Grizzly Young Veterans and even now, I think that they are one, some two of the best talkers on the planet sometimes, especially Zach Gibson. Gibson is um, phenomenal. Yeah, he's phenomenal on the mic. He's a perfect heel. Uh, if they ever choose to turn him babyface, that'll be a criminal activity. But uh, as a heel on the microphone, is second to none. And like I say, in the ring, he's pretty special too. Yeah, and so like I definitely wanted them to win. I'd want them to win. But I take your point on Imperium not holding the gold yet. And all four teams in this match have, except for Imperium, held the gold or some gold at some point. Um, I think Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster could be an interesting pick as well mm. because they recently um, they recently purchased a professional wrestling... Uh, yeah, uh, ca- ca- uh, Pro Wrestling Chaos in Bristol. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. They, they, they uh, recently picked that up and it might be almost like, and I, and I look at this as maybe a token gesture from Triple H to say, hey, I'm, you know, I've destroyed most of the UK scene. Uh, why don't I give the championships to someone who will go uh, going into a situation where they can be pushed as that? Um, I, I'd like to see, especially because I know that Flash Morgan Webster, especially his story um, coming back from potential injury, a career ending injury. Um, I think it would be quite nice to see them win. And I think that they have they have a nice connection to the crowd. Mark Andrews as well. Um, 
it is a pick em, isn't it? Like, it mm. really is. Um, and I, I would probably say if it wasn't GYV, it should be Imperium. But if I was, if I was putting my bit down at Ladbrokes, it would be Imperium. Yeah. I mean, just thinking ahead to uh, World Collide on the 25th of this month, the day before the Royal Rumble, you've obviously got NXT versus NXT UK. Now, already they've announced a uh, faction versus faction match, Undisputed Era versus Imperium. Now, of course, uh, every member of Undisputed Era are currently all draped in gold. You've got the uh, NXT champion, the North American champion and the uh, tag team champions. Wouldn't it be interesting to have Imperium on the other side with Walter? UK champ and Imperium as a tag team champion. So the two factions holding all the gold in their respective brands, that could be interesting. That could be interesting. But uh, how about Kaylee Ray, Tony Storm and Piper Niven, the triple threat for the UK Women's Championship? Now, of course, Tony Storm, um, she was the second ever champion. I think Rhea Ripley was the first and Tony Storm won, uh, beat Rhea Ripley in Blackpool 1 last year, taking over Blackpool 1 in January 2019. Kaylee Ray uh, beat Tony Storm to win the NXT UK Women's Championship at TakeOver Cardiff. Um, in a bit of a damp squib, to be honest with you, it wasn't well received. And uh, that match kind of demonstrated Tony Storm's, you know, fragile kind of mindset. It was uh, very much uh, the, the story going into it was Kaylee Ray playing mind games with Tony Storm, and it did seem to affect her performance on the night in Cardiff. Piper Niven, um, this will be her first takeover, a uh, first takeover match involved in a championship match. We know that all three of these know each other very, very well. Uh, friends at one point in their in their career, I'm sure they're all still uh, bosom buddies backstage. But the, the storyline that's being played out is that they were once friends, now bitter enemies, all going for the same common goal, the championship. Um, so this one is, is, is going to be a great match. I mean, there's not a weak match on this card at all. Um, I like Kaylee Ray as a champion. I think she's been a, a great champion. I think she delivers on the microphone. She's that cocky heel that can back it up in the ring as well. Um, that's why I'm going for a Kaylee Ray retain here. Um, but what about yourself? Uh, any different to my thinking there? Who do you think is going to take the gold on Sunday night? Well, again, um, all three women, I think that they they do exude like like excellence. Like someone like Piper Niven. Uh, I know obviously Piper's going through some issues at the moment, uh, yeah. some health issues. Um, you know, we've talked about, like people have spoke about this before. Um, she has a similar uh, condition to, to JR and, you know, it's, it's knocked her confidence. And, you know, she's making a joke about it now. And I, I personally, I think that it's amazing that she's coming out the other end of it and saying, you know what? I'm not going to be a shrinking violet. I'm not going to. I'm not going to disappear, leave the scene. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and I'm going to mm. go out there and kick ass. So for that, yeah, I give her major kudos and credit because I know a lot of people that probably would have been like, you know what, that's it. I'm done now. Um, so her in this match, I think, is very special. I, I think it's very. It gives it that. Um, doesn't mean that I wanted to win the championship just because of that, but I think that it could. It could add to that story. Yeah, Tony agreed. Storm. Yeah, Tony Storm. Of course, she's Tony Storm. She's great. She's uh, she's someone that I see when I went to go and see that show at NXT UK. She was women's champ at the time, and you know the crowd loved her. Uh, funnily enough, at that point, I think that Piper Niven came out to attack Rhea Ripley, if I remember correctly, on that night. Um, and Kaylee Ray, uh, Kaylee Ray. Kaylee Ray, isn't she? She's great on the mic. But I do agree with you saying about the damp squib. I think that Kaylee Ray wasn't built enough before she won that championship. So even though the British audience may have known who she was, the world audience weren't too sure. Um, I think that we're going to get to see some really, really, really spectacular, a really spectacular triple threat match. And in a way, I want Tony Storm to win this. Um, because I think that with Worlds Collide coming up, and I think that it would be nice to have yeah. those champion versus champion matches. Um, but I, I kind of feel like, yeah, I, I kind of feel like Piper Niven will get the championship this time. Mm -hmm. I think that interesting, it, 
it's a great story. Um, I also kind of like the fact that within NXT, you don't have many multiple time winners. So like someone like Shayna Baszler being a two time NXT women's champion, that was like first time ever, you know, like first time ever, you've got two time champ. So I like the fact that the belt doesn't necessarily bounce back from person to person. Like it's almost like that. That, that that like seal of approval so Piper Niven hasn't held the NXT UK Women's Championship yet Tony Storm has on that basis I'd like Piper Niven to come out the winner and to then have something moving forwards but so yeah I think my pick would probably be Piper Niven to win the championship yeah that and that, 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 that would be a good result I think and, and when you think about Tony Storm I think that they're setting her up for a run in NXT over in the States, uh, the black and gold brand, of course. So I think that's where her future lies, um, if not possibly moving on to, you know, a, a Raw or SmackDown. But I think that stateside is where Tony Storm's immediate future lies and possibly a, definitely a long-term future. Um, by this, she'll go into that match with Rhea Ripley on the 25th at Wells Clyde as the NXT UK Women's Champion. Mm, not sure, but I think that if they were to give the championship to Piper Niven or keep it on Kaylee Ray, then that, that kind of means that you're not blurring the lines too much and you're keeping the belt on a predominantly UK-based wrestler. So, yeah, although I said Kaylee Ray, I wouldn't be disappointed if it landed on uh, Piper Niven, to be honest with you. And I think Tony Storm doesn't need the NXT UK Women's Championship to succeed over in the States on the black and gold brand. So I think one of the other two would sit well with me. Uh, but let's talk about the main event then. Walter, um, he's been the champion since TakeOver New York WrestleMania weekends, April 2019, taking on Joe Coffey now, of course, their first Face-to-face -face happens 12 months to the day at TakeOver Blackpool 1, where Walter unceremoniously booted Joe Coffey over the ropes to the floor after his grueling match with Pete Dunne. And that was one of my matches of the year. Um, and both guys wrestled each other to exhaustion in that one. But no Pete Dunne anymore. But it is the two Apple, uh, you know, aforementioned wrestlers, Walter, the current champion, versus Joe Coffey. Now, Joe Coffey's gone for a bit of a uh, transition over recent months from the dastardly heel to more of a, a babyface feel. And if you uh, have watched the NXT UK TakeOver kind of pre-show that they've had on the network the last few days, I think it's, I uh, can't remember exactly the name of it, it's uh, Project Target oh. or, ta uh, yeah. do you know the one I'm referring to? But yeah, yeah, one, I know exactly what you mean. It yeah. really shines a great light on Joe Coffey, his character, his history, his family life, his professional life, and uh, it, ton of, it does build a lot of interest and a lot of intrigue into him as a wrestler and him as an individual, and uh, they're really kind of pushing him as, as a as as a, as, a, as a contender now against Walter for the UK Championship. I'm looking forward to this one. Now, out of the five matches, I must admit, this was the match I was least looking forward to because you've got two big wrestlers. Um, the other four matches kind of stood out as being slightly more exciting matches to me initially. But having watched that, that kind of documentary about NXT UK leading up to Blackpool 2, um, I'm looking forward to this one more than I was. I don't think we're going to get a new champion, to be honest with you. I think that the plan is, is to keep the belt on Walter, but definitely to push Joe Coffey more as a key babyface uh, on the brand. Um, so I don't think Joe Coffey will win. I think he'll come up short on this occasion. I think it's going to be a brutal match. I think these two are going to knock lumps out of one another. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the, the two wrestlers in a nutshell, really. They're two big, bruising wrestlers. They can pull out some, some good moves. I do enjoy their style. Um, but I'm going to go for Walter for this one um, because I think that he's the name they need to keep the championship on at the moment. Um, but what about yourself, Fel? Uh, Joe Coffey versus Walter. Are we going to see a title change on Sunday? No. Nope. <laughs> yep, I, I take it straight away. Walter's keeping that championship, man. Like, he, um, he has killed everybody that he's gone up against he um and he needs to because i think that whoever then dethrones him you know and it's it's that kind of feel isn't it i think that with nxt uk we've had that old school feel where you have a champion that holds the champion and you know like of course we had that with pete dunn who held it for so long tyler Bate held it for quite a while as well um i think that with with walter i think that you need him to hold the title for so long, to give him that gravitas. 
it, what I like about NXT UK, which is something that I talked about with the women's matches, is that you don't just bounce the title around back and mm. forwards. You know, it's not a hot potato championship. It is. You've got the championship. You hold it from takeover to takeover. I think that the big shock would be for Joe Kofi to win it. That would be a big swerve. But that would have diminishing returns because as you then roll up to, say, um, WrestleMania weekend, Joe Kofi doesn't have the name recognition that Walter has. Very true. And I think that's what it is, is that you still need to build him a little bit, just a little, just a little bit, just pop him back in the oven for a little bit. Because with Volta, I think that people know who he is. People would happily go to an NXT UK show, you know, just an NXT UK show happening at WrestleMania week. They wouldn't go to one where Joe Kofi was the champion, I think, though. I, I, I think that they would definitely, the crossover appeal for Volta. Um, I, I love Volta. I, I think that he's, um, when he turned up at that show, I didn't know a lot about him when he turned up at NXT last year at TakeOver. Um, I, I'd learned a little bit about him beforehand, but seeing him in the matches that he's had in NXT UK, seeing him at Mania Weekend... Um, I, I, I fell in love with him and I, I think that he he is a champion he is the big boss champion yeah. he is the guy you have to defeat you know like you, you've got to throw everything at him you might go three times against him and you might just about squeak the third one um, and it gives the championship it's a situation where he's now making the championship as opposed to the championship making him um, so if they had a rematch, if him and Joe Kofi had a rematch at say like Mania Weekend, I'd watch it. Like, um, but I don't think that that's the night for him to win it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know don't... what you're saying. I, I think I think that uh, Walter is the man to build a brand around. Um, he's he's got the presence. He's got the history. Um, he's got he's got the, the 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 look and the style. But I think he's definitely the man that you build. Uh, the brand around, as opposed to Joe Coffey. Uh, like I say, he's not putting back in the oven. He's not quite ready yet. One possible scenario I can see coming out of Sunday night is one of my earlier predictions was Jordan Devlin to beat Tyler Bate. I've always been looking forward to a proper takeover match between Tyler Bate and Walter. And I think at the end of Sunday, after the main event is all done and, and Walter is holding the bow high above his head, I wouldn't be surprised to see something similar to what we saw 12 months ago. Somebody come out to face to face with Walter. And I think that could be Jordan Devlin. I think he could seriously set himself up as a contender to the UK Championship to Walter when all said and done on Sunday night. What do you think to that one? I like that. I like that a lot. I, I, I think that like you, you, you need to have someone like a Jordan Devlin going up against uh, Walter. And I think it would be nice as that kind of mirror that we have within NXT shows to have that similar situation where, yeah, you get Jordan Devlin come out after the match and just be like, so I'll see you, I'll see you at Mania then? <laughs> like, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah you. that would be awesome. Like, <laughs> wouldn't it be great? Be like, uh, yeah, so I, I, you haven't beaten me yet. I'll see you at Mania. And I think that it would be nice to end the show like that um, and maybe even give you folks in attendance a little dark match. Like, that, wouldn't that be nice? Um, yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> But, but yeah, um, I, I, I really, yeah, I think that that would be, I think that would be great. I think that would be a really, really nice way to to get to Mania Weekend and to have that that as a match and that as a story going through. Because Jordan Devlin is technically heel, but in this situation, he would probably be closer to face. You could even do maybe like like a little bit of a turn along the way. Like to have Jordan Devlin maybe not have this as a heel or a face thing and just be like, I don't, I'm not a good guy, I'm not a bad guy, I'm not the guy, I don't want to say that, but I'm not a good guy, I'm not a bad guy, but I just want that championship, I'm taking it from you. And it would be a believable thing for him to go up against Gallus on the weeks and maybe even team up with Tyler Bate, you know, after that match. Like and have him have a little bit of his own little mini stable to help him go up against the, the threat of Volta and Imperium. Yeah. I can see it now. I can see it now. But 
uh, it's going to be a fantastic show. I'm sure you'll be watching it on the network. I can't wait to be there. I'm very lucky to be there live in attendance uh, with my good friend Matt Bayless. And that will, of course, be our next episode of Wrestling with John as we're going to try to record uh, a bit of a reaction episode following TakeOver Blackpool 2, immediately following back in our hotel room, hopefully. Um, and that'll be episode 94. Hopefully we'll be able to get that up that same evening, which will be a really good kind of fresh recap from myself and Matt. Uh, but Fel, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Wrestling Majolis podcast. I want to thank you so much for being uh, you know, an excellent guest host. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the experience and hopefully we can have you back on again sometime in the future. Dude, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. I, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, and it's it's great to be on a show that I get to see every now and then anyway, myself, Wrestling With Jonas. Uh, it's great to have been asked and it's great to get a chance to pop on here. And I'm more than more than happy to have you pop on at some point as well uh, and have the Wrestling for Jonathan's experience happen in a foul original. That would be great. I'd love that. I really would love that. But uh, before we let you go, uh, just one final opportunity to throw out any any plugs, any social media plugs, any any handles, um, any place where we can get to see or listen to your great voice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I might have put this voice on there. <laughs> well, you can, you can join me on youtube.com slash Foul Original Wrestling, where I'm live every Wednesday and Sunday at 8 p.m. UK time. That's GMT, 3 p.m. Eastern for the weekly wrestling recap, where we talk about wrestling. And then I'm also available on like linktree.foul original. Uh, you can check me out remote wrestling. Um, all of my Twitter hand, my Twitter handle is at foul underscore original. Uh, you can also check out fouloriginal.com. Um, I'll be doing, funnily enough, I'll be doing a live stream watch along for NXT UK TakeOver uh, 2 this Sunday. You can Brilliant. check that out on YouTube. We might do a little reaction afterwards. And then directly after that, I'll be doing a watch along for Impact Hard to Kill because I hate my sleep pattern. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that will be happening on youtube.com slash foul original wrestling as well we'll do a little breakdown of it afterwards as well awesome thank you for that foul and thank you for coming on and being an excellent guest so please keep it tuned to the wrestling with Jonas podcast for all of your weekly nxt and aw updates and uh, occasional wwe and aw pay-per-view reviews and so much more including exclusive interviews uh, my most recent one was with a uh, big effin joe uh, uh but former champion of rise underground uk so go and check that out uh, and uh, if you have enjoyed listening to this podcast please don't forget to spread the word tell your friends and tell your family don't forget to subscribe to the wrestling with Jonas podcast Podcast so you don't miss out on a single episode. And don't forget to check out our, our uh, website, wrestlingwithjohners.com, where you can find all of our social media links and our link to all of our archive of podcasts, vlogs, video casts, interviews, uh, articles, news reports, merchandise, and so much more. So thanks again to uh, Fel for coming on the podcast, and thanks to all of my listeners. Mm-hmm.